Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is time once again to um, get your mugs out. I've got my own uh, unpopular opinions mug here. It came through the post this morning. I've also got a now get out one. Um, I quite I quite like the uh, the unpopular opinions mug, uh, Mister D. Um, it seems like the now get out one outsells it. Um, if I look at the the, the sales numbers, but. Mm. Um, I quite like the unpopular opinions one. It's it's got a kind of um, you know retrograde charm to it um, with the kind of Sergeant Pepper motif. Um, and I'm drinking a nice uh, nice mug of um, Marks and Spencer's strong uh, strong <laughs> black tea here. Uh, what beverages do you fellows have? <clears throat> well, I have a, a very large uh, a very large mug of uh, very strong coffee and i have fizzy water uh and uh I, under my desk i have a bottle of gin in case that's required is there uh are there any raspberries in the sparkling water <laughs> no, <laughs> no not, not a raspberry in sight no and pharaoh uh, welcome to the deepest water yeah, thank you uh, i i am drinking a record lake strawberry and lime a bit of day drinking to uh, get the stream started Yes, and uh, it's um, you know it's a uh, it's a you know a late afternoon stream. Um, it's called the deepest law because it's a little bit off the beaten track. Not everybody's going to be able to make this. It's going to it's going to have a smaller crowd than usual, um, which is to be expected for a for a stream about art in the late afternoon. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, but uh, that makes it all the more exclusive. I wouldn't. I, I would see it in terms of exclusivity, um, and uh, that's uh, typically what the art world has um, has uh, involved itself with. Um, mm. Now, um, um, uh, yes, I was trying to think of the ways of um, getting into this um, into this stream, and a lot of people are. Um, Already talking about a certain Paul Joseph Watson in the uh, in the ch in the chat, um, mm. and if we uh, have a little look, every once in a while, about once a year, PJW releases a rant in which he attacks modern art. His first one back in 2016 was called "The Truth About Modern Art." Then he had why modern art is absolute crap in 2017 um modern art is still uh shite um 2019 and then his latest effort was latest atrocities in modern art now b before we get into this um uh, aside from his views on art uh pjw yes or no mr d <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, I feel like you're asking a certain type of question there. Um, yeah, I, hmm. I, I, you know, I, I think if 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 one could separate the the uh, the, the physical from the spiritual man, then uh, yeah, then perhaps after a few few drinks, I I'd, I'd certainly have a go. He's tall and uh, seems fairly well groomed, but uh, but again, you know, he if, there's there's this this idea of the, of the hot crazy axis where you you don't sort of get involved with people past a certain point and i think he may fall out of the out of the range of that so. <laughs> um I, I i won't ask you the same question pharaoh because i i uh, i assume that uh uh you have different tastes mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and i'm just <laughs> of it. i'm just looking at some of his other videos here the truth about sluts and cheaters <laughs> Why modern architecture sucks. I didn't even know he had these in his locker room. He's been attacking architecture as well, Pharaoh. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you can say what you like. He does have a lot of views for his videos. So, um, yeah. Well, he's, he's got 1.84 million subscribers. And I thought what we could do is we could watch a little bit of The Truth About Modern Art by PJW. <laughs> and when you gentlemen, um, I mean, I should say, we, before we even start this, we should probably establish our basic positions on this question. Um, I, I can go first if you want. Um, I am uh, somebody who has, let's say, a mild interest in uh, art, which is to say I have visited many a gallery. 
Um, I occasionally go to exhibitions in, in London. Um, and um, uh, I would say that um, it really depends on what modern art means. So I'll give you an example. One of my favorite uh, art galleries in the world is uh, the one in Chicago. I think it's called the, is it the Chicago Institute the, of Modern the, Art. The art, in, the art Institute of Chicago, yes. yes. Okay, yeah, the Art Institute of Chicago. Now, I quite like a lot of the early 20th century art in there. Um, mm -hmm. And and there are things. Um, there's the famous uh, picture of Dorian Gray in there, for example. There's uh, American Gothic, you know, the, um, the the one with the with the couple holding the the, yep. the uh, pitchfork. Um, yeah, I Grant guess it is. Wood, yeah, uh, the the, uh, the Grant Wood. I quite like the. Um, I quite I, I like Night Hawks at dinner. I think that's in there. Uh, or, or Night Hawks in a diner. Yeah, um, uh, uh, no, no. yeah, I think it's just called Night 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 Hawks. I I have to check check, but yeah, Edward Hopper. Um, also, yeah, no, in no, case people are interested, the the portrait of Dorian Gray is Ivan Albright. Um, yes, so there's a I mean there's a lot of so those artists I just named there would they be considered modern art in the art parlance or is that uh, or is that kind of belonging to an older style? Um, well, uh, this this is the difficulty because the the, the term modern art is, is 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 basically meaningless. I mean, at a, at a in a certain amongst a certain group of people, certainly people interested in art history, modern art generally means uh, art associated with with modernism, which was a very specific kind of aesthetic and. Um, uh, movement in the early 20th century basically All, although it had antecedents in uh, um uh you know in the uh, up to the 1950s 60s 70s and 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 precedents in the 19th century as well so um but it, it, yeah i mean i think that that, that is it, it's very good to kind of establish what what we're talking about i think when the average person hears modern art they tend to think not only of kind of a period but also of more of a kind of style uh so i i think um yeah there is a bit of confusion in in terms which i hope we can we can talk about later but um i, I think it is the in the way that paul joseph watson is using it he actually means contemporary art in other words art being done at the moment um you know right. re yeah. recent 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 things yeah yeah, so, so I mean, I, I should explain. I do range forward a little bit. Um, I like pop art for my sins. Um, what's that one? The big splash, the Hockney. I mean, the, these are probably extremely philistine tastes, I'd imagine. But no, you know, main, you're not, no, 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 not at all, not at all. <laughs> the, the biggest splash. I I love uh, uh, David Hockney, but you know, uh, again, I mean, David Hockney would be considered a reactionary at this point in in in, in <laughs> certain in certain circles. So. Yeah. Um, I also like. The, who's that? Uh, Hamilton. Um, yeah, Richard, Richard Hamilton. Richard. Yeah. I, I went. I went to see his uh, exhibition when it was on at the Tate. Um, I quite liked. Um, there was an East meets West pop art thing they did uh, mm. in London a while back, and I, yeah. I bought the book. You know, the big hardback uh, coffee right. table book. Um, so you know, I can range forward. But um, I kind of like things like faded Soviet Coca-Cola <laughs> signs and things like that, you know. <laughs> um, so there's a kind of, uh, in fact, I don't mind Soviet art as well. I don't know if that counts as modern, but um, mm -hmm. yeah. there, are as there are aspects of kind of, uh, you know, um, that sort of thing that, uh, that, I, that I quite like. Um, now, Pharaoh, what's what's your kind of general general view on these sorts of? Uh, so, oh, I will say though, I do have an aversion. So, I, I somebody's asking, what about abstract art? Or I'm yeah. not a fan of the Pollock, Jackson Pollock, mm. where it's simply paint splattered on the wall, <clears throat> and um, the cover for this um, for this stream is uh, what's it, what's the chap's name, D? What's the name of this artist? The 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 stabber of the canvas. Oh, Lucio Fontana. Yeah. Yeah. It is yeah. So this is in the I believe it's in the Tate Modern, where it's just a series of canvases that have been slashed or stabbed with a pencil. Um, 
And to me, this is where it starts getting, well, you know, anybody, like, when it gets to the stage where it feels like anybody, like a child could do it, uh, so you're removing the element of skill. Uh, and on top of that, where you're then justifying these random acts of vandalism with fairly pretentious plaques on the wall, you know, trying to claim <clears> there's some <throat> deep meaning to it when all that's uh -huh. happened is that it's just paint or just... Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so so I, I have an aversion to that. Um, so, so maybe we can get into that later on. But Pharaoh, yeah. what, what, what do you think? Y yes, so... Uh, you know, I like quite a lot of um, early early modernism, and again, I think that to Dee's point, it's one hundred percent right to say that um, you know, modern art it's more about time and a collection of artistic groups as opposed to um, you know one unifying thing. And and I think we're all sort of looking at this through maybe a little bit of a progressive view of history, where art starts here and it has progressed to this point. But you've got lots of these little offshoots and. Um, you know, little clusters of people, some that aren't even recognised in their own lifetime. Um, but, but for me, certainly, um, I would consider mo uh, modern art to be from the Impressionist up to pop art, basically. And, um, you know, not necessarily from a time perspective, everything inside there, because you've still got other art movements going on. I mean, just in terms of my personal taste, like, I, I, I do, again, I, I agree with you, I do like, um, you know, little bits here and there. Certainly the earlier part of modernism, I think, has got a lot of, um, you know, in, interesting interesting bits going on. Big big fan of um, certain parts of surrealism, for example. But I, th I think fundamentally, um, while modern, um, modernism doesn't have a unifying ideology or, or group of, um, you know, tenants, if you investigate the manifestos of some of these early groups, they are, um, you know, they take very progressive ideas, they take very subvertive ideas, and all, all we've seen really is the carrying out of these ideas that were kind of started in the 1910s and then rolled out. Um, and they, you know, modernism starts out as being against the academy. It takes over the academy and has now fully pushed and rolled out its um, its ideas. So I, I think while there are good there's good bits of art inside, inside modernism for sure. I, I think that the fundamentals behind them are exceedingly subvertive. And I think what's interesting is that, that a lot of people can see that, even though they're not necessarily an expert in art, they can see that something isn't right and there's that un, like, uneasy feeling. And that's why someone like PJW, who, you know, uh, not, no offense to him, is a bit of a Luddite, but um, he can still sense the subversion in the art. And that's my concern. It's less about individual pieces but more actually some of those big ideological ideas so, so just before i ask uh these for some views um there is something else i want to try to get at which is the distinction between uh modernism and postmodernism. yes now, I, I i i don't know a huge amount about these things i only have a you know uh degree a master's degree in modernism from oxford university with a distinction but uh really i know i really i actually know nothing about uh <laughs> modernism at all um but in the in the literary uh world um the distinction between modernism and postmodernism tends to be um um basically uh, uh modernism still believes in some sense in capital t truth so if you take something like the the T.S. Eliot poem. Uh, he understands that he's in that he's in a time where things have been fragmented, that so that he's no longer living in the unified world of, let's say, the you know the twelfth century with uh, Christianity at the centre. Yeah. He's living he's living in modernity. He's living in a time where things are confused. But ideally, the likes of a T.S. Eliot or an Ezra Pound would like, or they still reach for, or they still believe in, big T, capital T, truth whatever that happens to be, yep. um, which, which, is, which is why you ended up with, I mean, you, I mean, from many different perspectives, you could say, well, the likes of a, uh, a T.S. Eliot or an Ezra Pound or uh, somebody like Wyndham Lewis were, were essentially reactionary figures, even in their own day. Um, and this is why you, you even had like, you know, right wing figures or right wing politicians, um, <laughs> You know, I mean, famously, Ezra Pound supported the fascists. You know, um, he supported uh, Mussolini for a period, and then, and then, he even he even sp spent time in jail for that for that association, did he not? Um, so th that, but that's how it works in the literary world. What about in the world of 
art in the world of like, like you know, I mean the I, visual arts or painting or whatever you'd call it. The, stuff the, you, the, pl the, pl the plastic arts, yes. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's almost exactly analogous to 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 the way it fu functions in literature. I mean, basically the exact same concerns. The 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 I would I would sort of put pop art, uh, at least the you know the movement that was mostly associated with Americans. I would put pop art as the as the as the the pivot point where modernism basically, uh, at least as it was pursued by a majority of people, started to 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 to, to be denied. To be denied, I think that that pop pop art was kind of the turn from modernism into postmodernism um, because it was the, the the that whole movement was associated with with the kind of introduction of. Of, of irony and and the sort of uh, dissolution of, of narratives i mean again it, it's sort of strange to me that, that I, I encounter so many people who are ostensibly on the right who when they think of modern art they think of it as as an example of the this this kind of subversion that you that you mentioned but in a way modern modernism uh, you know again I, I i'm talking about as ferro said all of these these figures before Pop, pop art certainly back to the 19th century was still pursuing a kind of idea of 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 transcendence a, a sort of big like you said the capital t truth uh a, a sort of um a sort of uh greatness or or kind of um narrative uh and i think that the turn away from that is is actually more of the point where some of these kind of political criticisms start to to be to be valid uh you know i think that people get it wrong when they look at something like someone like P picasso or some someone like you know matisse or, or or mark rothko or one of one of these people as being kind of an example of the the shitness or the decadence or the the, the, the subversion of of you know of of modern art so yeah well so i mean i'm just i'm just i'm just picturing pjw looking at a rothko i mean rothko correct me if i'm wrong is the one where it's just like sheets of color right it's just like red or yeah, I mean, uh, well it, it, yeah color, color relationships you know very large uh pictures yeah and um i just think i just think pjw would look at that and just be like that's just that, that's just red mate yeah, see, see, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they, if, if this idea of focusing on the transcendence is in, is in the modernism, uh, is in uh, modern art. Like, if you think back to Duchamp, even where he's trying to create mm. um, anti-art right from the start, yeah. and that, 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 this is what I'm trying to say. Well, when I mean subversion, I mean specifically the undermining of um, core truths that supported the artistic establishment beforehand, and, and I think, um, you know, you know, like we'll see we'll see them in the video but um it's it's all about destroying what was there beforehand and creating something new in its place so so again i i have to draw on my okay i guess literary knowledge as opposed to art knowledge because that's where i know these terms from um <clears throat> but there's a there so once you get past modernism in the literary sphere there is there is also a split between various brands of postmodernism or postmodernity um first of all if you if you read if you try to read uh pound or elliot for example um you often need like footnotes they're, they're quite esoteric you know that they, they are consciously working within certain traditions in, in quite a self-conscious way um so so that it's almost like you would need um some degree of qualification in you know the, the classics or something just to really know what they're getting at so there's a kind of inbuilt elitism that which is very deliberate um in the in the, in the modernism um when you get to when you get to the uh, the ideas of postmodernism there's really two different ways of of viewing it okay so you have the um you have the kind of marxist idea where it's just a kind of moment in history where the authentic statement is impossible this is a kind of frederick jameson idea where it's right. like it's like you're walking through las vegas and rather than seeing the actual eiffel tower 
you're seeing the simulacra of the Eiffel Tower. You're seeing like the cheap plastic, late capitalist version of the uh, of the Eiffel Tower that some, you know, probable American gangsters put up there in Las Vegas. Um, so everything is kind of cheap and ersatz and um, inauthentic. Like in in the in the Jameson way of seeing things, even the even the Beatles, who people now would say, well, that's an authentic band. No, they'd say, well, that is actually a a kind of pale shadow of a, of something else. It's already inauthentic. It's already mass. It's already uh, it's already kind of you know in their in their parlance late capitalist. Um, where whereas um, the, the other way of viewing uh, the the postmodern uh, again in in literary studies is um, the, associated with a chap called. Uh, Leotard, Jean-François yeah. Leotard, who um, instead saw it as, a, as, a, as an active effort to break the rules. He wanted to smash the old meta-narratives in, quite, in, in almost the way that uh, Pharaoh was talking about there, the, 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 the smashing of, the, of, the, of what, I guess, what, what you call the truth regime. Um, and Leotard is quite uh, radical with that. He doesn't just mean the Bible. He also means like... So, you know, capital S science. He means basically anything that you could grip onto as capital T truth. That is the real thing that he is um, uh, that he is trying to achieve in the breaking apart of the rules. Um, so, in in a strange sense, in in the Jameson way of thinking about uh, postmodernism, um, it is a is it a passive condition basically, and there's nothing you can do about it. You're you're basically just stuck in an inauthentic moment. So all you can ha- hope to do is 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 imitate or a pastiche or you know create these inauthentic objects if you want to put it that way. Um, whereas the uh, in the Leotard sense, it's kind of a positive, positive or affirmative artistic move that is incumbent on you to do as an artist. Um, so that's my understanding coming from the background I do. How closely does that map onto the the art world, Mr. D? Uh, I think it, it, it ma- again, it's, it's almost analogous. In fact, um, certainly when, when I was, um, uh, I, I, di- I didn't study art per se, but I was involved um, quite heavily, you, you know, with uh, art and academia in the, in the 90s. And, um, and that and th- those authors, like you said, Jean Francois Lyotard, uh, you know, uh, uh, Michel Foucault, Baudrillard. I mean, all of those kind of French um, um, th- theorists were all the kind of standard reading for people receiving art or art historical training at that time. So all of that, the same kind of currency that had, you know, had gone through the literary world that also went through the the art world, at least in the the, the 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 academic kind of art criticism, you know, world that 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 I think still tries to kind of control uh, the the production end of art. In other words, the, these are the people who are teaching teaching people who go to get degrees in in art. So, um, uh, but yeah, all, all the, those I would I would broadly agree that those are were. Again, I don't know what, exactly what's being done now. I suspect it's it's quite different and, and, and quite focused on on the things we see in in in, in you know it, happening all around us with with ideas of race and identity. Yeah, and, and I, I I see. I should say as well though that I do not um, reflexively reject either of those two theses, even though one of them is coming from a Marxist and the other one is coming from you know, kind of leftist or radical, radical like Leah. I don't inherently or reflexively reject those. Um, in fact, I think I made a video in defense of postmodernism at some point. So um, there is something true about the fact that we do live in a strange age of pastiche. You know, all you have to do is look at something like X Factor or something like, um, you know, but what's happening on X Factor? Um, you know, I'm sure these days you'd probably get a contestant who is singing a song of a former winner who in themselves was just a kind of, you know, p- 
pale rendition of Tom Jones, who himself was a kind of, you know, glorified club singer, essentially. Um, you know, th th so th th there would be a way of saying, well, th th this is all right. That th it is true that this kind of pastiche problem is all around us. And how do you kind of get around? How do you break out of the, the problem of authenticity in 2020 is a real one, right? Right. But, but then I would question, like, what, why this obsession with, with the idea of authenticity? I mean, why, why are we, we, we insist on this? And, and why do we, again, why do we reflexively assume that, that this, this sort of pastiche or hybridization of, of, of different modes of, of, of culture, why, why do we kind of assume that that's just a, a condition of, you know, modern society or modern man and 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 why is it so bad i mean why you know who's to say that the that these pastiches aren't the way that that culture has always been produced in in in, in a certain sense so yeah, that's and, always my question yeah and i think there's a i think there's some truth to that uh one of my favorite bob Dylan albums is called love and theft um where practically every single line if you really know your delta blues You'll be able to say, "Oh, hold on, that was a Leroy. That was a Leroy car line, and oh, he's he's basically nicked that one." And it's very deliberate, you know. Every single line in it is stolen from somewhere. Um, mm. But but in a sense, that's what folk music is. It's kind of the half-year line that uh, the blues singer's picked up somewhere, and he's gone down the road, and he's, you know, now it's twenty years later, and he's singing it. He can't remember where he picked it up, but it, it and it and it becomes a kind of living and organic. Uh, tradition in in and of itself, and there's something interesting about that, uh, you know, in the American folk in the American folk scene. Um, but you see it everywhere. Like, I mean, you, I could pick up uh, you could pick up a Shakespeare play, and you'd be like, oh, hold on a second, that's uh, he's obviously he he's cribbed that from Seneca, and he's taken that. Well, that's clearly a bit from the Geneva Bible. And hold on a second, that's a a bleak reference to Chaucer, and um, I'm sure I read that bit in a Marlowe play once. Um, so so in in you know, even in Shakespeare, there's a lot of pastiche. There's a lot of, and there's a lot of playing with genre, and there's a lot of making fun of the conventions of genre. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's well, that's in that's in fifteen ninety three. And in music as well, if you look to, to, to you know even you know J S Bach or or Beethoven or you know, I mean, it, it was happening in music as well. Yeah, but I, I guess from my perspective, what what I would come back and say is, firstly. Uh, obviously, organic growth is based on tradition, but they're, they're, how I would describe it is that you've got, uh, Im imagine a tree, the tree, is, the tree is culture, and you've got like a taproot which comes down. You've always got one thing where it draws upon, and historically, we've had this taproot rooted in the, the lo locality, in that nation's um, c culture and, uh, and ideas. But what modernism does, it switches where that taproot is from, from a national to an international route. And again, I think what's interesting about some of the early modernist uh, artists is how much they're drawing from international sources, not in the way that you described, AA, in terms of, um, you know, I'm pulling bits, uh, it, I'm pulling small bits from here and here and there. Their roots are clearly sourced in, in, in other ideas. Again, if you were to go from a Spengler, uh, Spenglerian perspective, when he talks about the kind of autumn stage of civilizations where they're no longer pulling from their culture phase, they're pulling from other civilizations. That's what yeah. modernism is. If, if for example, um, you know, you think of uh, Van Gogh, he's obsessed with Japanese woodcuts. If you see uh, some of uh, Picasso's early, uh, early, uh, early, uh, early ish works, He's obsessed with African art and the African mask. If you see Gauguin, he's literally living in Tahiti. Um, the, the modernists are, are obsessed with internationalism at the expense of uh, the, the tradition. So I, I think there is nothing wrong with like drawing from an alternative source, but it's it's um, you know what takes preference: the traditions of your country and your ancestors, or an international community. Well, then I would I would I would counter and say well. I would think a lot of conservatives would say that that you know the the great architecture of Britain is is 
is manifested in jo you know the Georgian period. But where did that come from? Well, that came from Italy, with from Palladio. You know, what what about like Peter Paul Rubens? Well, he was you know he was painting images of of of, of Greek and Roman mythos from thousands of years before. I mean, I I don't think that that's anything new at all. I don't think that that's just a condition of modernism. I think it was ever thus. You know, I think I mean, we, we, were, on, on we were importing we were importing Chinese porcelains into into Europe in the you know in the in the fifteenth century. Uh, the yeah, 16th but it's century. always it's always seen through the lens of the native country. You talk about Rubens. Show me a Rubens that looks like a uh, a Roman fresco, for example. It looks totally different. Yes, he's pulling on cultural ideas and symbologies and allegories, but f fundamentally, he's rooted in the tradition of his land, and he's seeing it all through his lens, as opposed to the modernist that sees it in the lens of someone else. Well, I don't. But I, but but then. But Van Gogh doesn't look like Japanese woodcuts. I mean, even though he did, he did actually sort of paint versions of of specific uh, works of art. But I mean, you know, his work doesn't look like you know doesn't look at all like like sort of the the Japanese conception. Uh, yeah, I mean, th th there's there's also um, there's also this problem of what is the authentic. You know, um, I, I remember writing an essay once about uh, the absurdity of the notion of cultural appropriation, and my idea was the this idea that there's something inherently Indian about the curry, where when you know if you if you trace it, you know it's the Portuguese who brought vinegar over, and uh, I, th I think they may have introduced even introduced the chili at some point. Um, so it's like, well, you know, what's the what's the authentic curry? Is it the first? Is it the first one made by the chef in Punjab in 1630? Or what, like, what are we trying to get at? Um, you know, in in in, in literature. I think you get you end up with you know you basically end up with oh you're looking for William Blake who has made his own book and there's one you know he painstakingly made it himself and it's the original copy of the Songs of Innocence you know uh, you're never you're never going to get to that original authentic art or, yeah. ob object in the in the in the way that they are I guess what I'm saying is you end you end up with very strange things it's like well. Okay, in the world of in the world of cuisine, say, um, there's then a kind of reflexive. Well, a McDonald's that's not an authentic meal, or a ready meal that's not an authentic meal. But if we went up to the mountains and somebody gave you, you know, Oops. from the from the mountains of the Middle East, that it that is it authentic, and we're trying to get there. But why? Like, why do we think that? What what's what's inauthentic about the McDonald's or the ready meal? Genuine Very question. Good question. Very good yeah. question. I mean, you know, what about you know the curries uh, and, and, and you know with 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 the, with the hot chilies? Well, where did those chilies come from? Well, they came from the New World. They didn't come from India. You know, they didn't come. They didn't come from you know Vietnam. They didn't come from all the places where these chilies now form a kind of integral part of their their, their culinary traditions. I mean, I think that culture that that culture is uh, to to borrow the term. Um, appropriation i think it, it, it's all this hybridization and it's always been to some degree or other there there is no kind of in the in the way that we look look for it a, a kind of authentic experience um, yeah. and i don't yeah, know why I, we want it i don't know why we want it no, no, I, I, would, I would agree with all of that but what i guess the point i'm trying to make is when you're looking for cultural inputs in your new culture there is either the internal or the external and you have to choose one of one of them is going to be larger than the other, uh, essentially, isn't it? So that's that's the choice you have to make as a, an artist. What what do you draw from more from the internal traditions of your land or external ones? But on that, I mean, on that on that sort of thing, are we then saying you know William Wordsworth having a wander in the in the field of daffodils and writing a poem is more is more authentic than? Uh, Coleridge imagining Kublai Khan. So when I was like, because yeah. one of one of them is one of them is rooted in the English countryside, and the other one has gone all exotic and you know yeah, Oriental. Uh, 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 Coleridge obviously isn't have hasn't got more influences from external and internal. He's still writing with all of the traditions of uh, like the r r Romantic from the English poet. All that happens is that his subject matter is Kublai Khan. What I'm talking about is, say, Coleridge went off to do a, a haiku 
about something totally different. Do you know, do you know what I'm saying? It's like, but uh, but but even 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 I mean even even within that though, I mean if you look at the actual forms that these poets used, you say, well, I mean I could go in and say, well, that's that's Tertorima. He took that from Dante, and this, uh, you know, th well, there's a sonnet, or that's also Italian in origin, and um, or oh, there he's using a French variation. So in in, in many cases, even the I mean, unless again you're going to try to rewrite Beowulf, I don't know what I don't know what is authentically English, even within even within that canon, if that makes any sense. And even Beowulf, you know, I mean, how, to what degree were were these traditions that came from you know Scandinavia? But yeah, I, I guess I'm not so concerned with the authenticity point. You know, I, you know, I would agree that like. Even if something is mainly externally cultural, I think you could argue that it's authentic. But, but, but fundamentally, you still have a question in your artwork whether um, the things you are drawing from, both in terms of the medium, the, um, the scene, the narrative, the stylistic choices, are they mainly from external or the, or the internal? So like, I, I think we're seeing it from two different places here. But what, what, while we're on the subject of Coleridge um, and the Romantics, I do actually think that they may have, you know, before I pay the, the PJW video, I actually think that Coleridge uh, may have an indirect, uh, and Wordsworth may have an indirect influence on PJW, even if he doesn't know it, because they would simply say, listen, all this stuff we're talking about doesn't matter. Does it inspire awe? Does it give you a sense of the sublime? Does it, uh, you know, it, is there a terrible beauty that you can see uh, and that you can feel? Um, and that's a kind of romantic sensibility, yep. and I I feel like that's really the tradition that PJW is coming from, where he thinks, well, if it's not, if it doesn't inspire beauty, and again, it's getting towards some sense of transcendence, but not in a didactic way, but just in the way it makes you feel, in a kind of subjective way, I guess. Um, it's kind of like a German idealist idea. I mean, even the idea we're talking about is German. Um, but yep. I I feel I feel like PJW may be getting at that, like capital R romantic. Well, uh, yeah, I, I think there's something really interesting here because, again, this is one of, one of the key modernist points in my mind is the is the, the removal of the idea of the the um, the Burkean notion of beauty being stored in an object, and the modernist goes to the materialist, um, uh, em emotional. How what do I feel about the object? So, for example, Burke would say that a mountain possesses sublimity, right? Sub sublimity. Um, it, it's, it's, it's like a, a feature it has, but um, in the mind of the uh, in the mind of the emotions, it's all, um, an emotion is described by James, for example, as the brain's response to the viscera. So that's kind of like you, like different parts of your body, etc. So you're always um, the, the concept of beauty doesn't come from the object itself. It's always about the body. So th th there is this big change in modernism from. Um, Beauty being something that the object has, to beauty, beauty being what you can what you consider in your head, and the consequence of that is basically moral subjectivism. You know, if if beauty is something like if I think that's beautiful, and you can think something else is beautiful, then th there is no true objective beauty anymore, if that makes sense in the in the Burkean notion. And that's why that's what one thing I think that PJW does try to, to highlight. Well, I, I but I, I question, you know, like you know the example of mountain i mean it, it almost it almost sounds like one of those sort of zen koans you know like is a mountain beautiful if there isn't a human to appreciate it is is it is it is it, is, is the act of the, of of human perception uh, and i think the human centered uh, uh, kind of reaction to what he sees uh, when looking at a mountain, it, uh, I mean, that is is that where beauty lies, or is if humans had never evolved, would a mountain still be beautiful? Would we even have? Would there be beauty without yeah, in, the, the in, human in, in, in subjectivity? Burke, in Burke's idea, the, uh, yes, because it's a it's an uh, a property that the mountain possesses. It possesses sublim sublimity. Hmm. Uh, all right. Well, with all of these very interesting thoughts in mind, why don't we um, keep them in mind while we watch um, well-known <laughs> art critic Paul from, Joseph Watson from, from, Ed, from Edmund Burke to Paul Joseph Watson? Well, I, I mean, I, I I feel like Burke and possibly Scruton may may be lurking behind PJW's basic ideas here. Um, I, I mean, it, 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 in a way, we're getting. Heads. 
we're, we're probably getting the McDonald's version of Scrutiny yeah. Burke in yeah. PJW here, right? Um, so let's uh, let's have it, let's see what he says. With a light switching on and off, a blue canvas with a white line down the middle. Uh, hold on. An empty room with a light switching on and off, a blue canvas with a white line down the middle. Are you lying? People running around in a circle with their fingers up each other's butts. This masterpiece, an unmade bed. Yoko Ono screaming like a demented bitch. Modern art or conceptual art isn't art at all. It's one big circle jerk of pretentious twats trying to make themselves look sophisticated by ascribing so, meaning so, to something that's completely... So again, just in the first few seconds, he's conflated completely different things. And in fact, he even hedged, did you hear, modern art or conceptual art. Well, those aren't the same things, you know. I mean, and again, he, he I think he, in his, in his, you know, high dudgeon, even uh, a sort of understands that. So he had to kind of throw that line in. I mean, I think Barnett Newman, which is the line uh, down the canvas, which was, you know, done probably in the 19... 60s uh you know that's a very different kind of uh way a completely kind of different set frame than you know yoko ono or or or, or tracy emmons bed you know so again i think he's he's already being disingenuous but with conflating things that that have nothing to do with one another to, to, to step in and defend PJW here, like, um, I think what he is highlighting is, again, another key tenant of modern art, and that is the uh, egalitarianness of um, forms. So if you look at um, how the Romans thought about art, they would sort it between the sordid arts and the free arts. So there were certain types of art forms that were hierarchically better than others by nature. You know, this, this idea evolves into the idea of fine arts, uh, or arts and crafts, etc. But from the traditionalist view, not every single art form is the same. And I'll, and I'll give an example of this. Uh, I would say that oil painting as an art form has m more potential for transcendence than uh, spoon whittling, for example, as, 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 as an art form. Now, the modernist says, no, 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 actually, all art forms have the potential to be equally good, equally good as each other. And what you see in the, in the modernist is an explosion of what can be considered art. And even, obviously, you have um, Duchamp's urinal there. What, what he was trying to do with that is to show literally, you know, uh, in the modernist mind, anything can be art. So, again, it's, while he, he's done it in a bombastic way, he's trying to highlight a specific point here. And it's the modernist considers anything to have the potential to be art while the traditionalist says certain forms are better than others. Yeah, which is rubbish, but uh, go ahead. Listen, there is good modern art, and there are many skilled modern artists. So why is it usually mm -hmm. the most talentless, vacuous shit that gets promoted and funded by the art establishment? Well, it's partly born out of elitism. If the artistic merit of a bunch of squiggly lines oh can only be appreciated by a select number of privileged insiders. They can then sneer at the uninitiated and justify their own intellectual superiority. When you see someone... Stop here a second, sorry. Yeah. I think there's an interesting point around elitism, and actually this is a non... Uh, it's an anti-traditionalist viewpoint, because art has always been elite, even back to the very always. first ob yes. object. It's always been the, uh, the reserve of the top of society. So... From my perspective, it's like you're arguing with art itself there. Yeah, and I, 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 again, it brings up a fundamental question. Why does PJW or anyone else think that he, that, that he, that, that all art should be accessible to him? I mean, again, I, this is, I, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't see how you can be a kind of person who appreciates culture in any way, right, if you're on the right, uh, without being a self-admitted elitist you know i mean I, I, I mean what is wrong with you know again we we say we, we you know we believe in hierarchy well if you believe in hierarchies if you if you if you profess to believe that this i think one of the sort of fundamental tenets of of a lot of right-wing thought then why do you have a problem with uh, uh, something that requires you know um 
knowledge and study and and appreciation you know to to kind of enter into a dialogue with why is there a problem with with things that he would again which is just dismissed as pretentious you know well what what is the problem with elitism in that sense i mean uh, again, I'm 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 not saying you know I I think there's a fundamental fallacy here in the in the idea that there is a a modern art. There are many 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 universes of of modern art or contemporary art, I, uh, I should say. Um, but if you but want I, if I you mean... want to look if you want to look at Cy Twombly, which was the large painting with the red, which he called Squiggles, um, yeah. you you can enter into that world. It, it's a certain kind of dialogue set references certain things are happening there if you're not interested in that you can enter into a very traditionalist world of people who do oil paintings portraits you know uh, genre subjects i mean in the old manner i mean all of these worlds exist uh, it's just that there is this kind of one people think that there is one narrative when there isn't uh, and and i think it's always been that way uh, to one degree or another but but I I think Peter W. suspicion is that the emperor has no clothes when it comes to the squiggles as he puts it. Okay, you can you know you can read up on it and you can read all of these kind of what he would see as post hoc justifications of it. But at the end of the day, a bloke has just put some squiggles on a canvas and you know. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think there's an interesting point there around um, elites and corrupted elites. So for example, how do we know that our elites haven't been su uh, supplanted by uh, I don't know, bug men who are just producing, you know, in their in their their minds, they they're elites. They are producing quality artworks. I, I think the problem you have with that, though, is that um, is trying to get an idea of the quality of art. You know, what what is um, good art, and it's something you need. You need time. You know, you need. Um, you know, Ruskin describes as you need to have. He said, whenever you create a building, you need to wait 500 years to, to understand whether it's a good building or not. And I think there is some kind of truth in that. You, we, we can't tell if this current elite group is corrupted um, purely on what, what we think. You need some time and, and a gap in between. All right. Well, let's, uh, let, let's, let's continue to see what other points uh, PJLW makes here. And then I'll read some super chats. It's a Jackson Pollock style vomit canvas. They're not really trying to ascertain its deeper meaning. It's all just an act to prove to the other pompous wankers that they're part of the same cult of aesthetic relativism. While sneering at the Philistine general public who just don't get it, despite the fact that there's nothing to get. Here's a test I give my graduate students, all talented and well-educated. Please analyze this Jackson Pollock painting and explain why it is good. It is only That's after not a Jackson Pollock painting. Answers, but I inform them that the painting is actually a close-up of my studio apron. Modern art. <laughs> no, I hear you, I, D, I, under your breath, so that's not a Jackson Pollock. Of I course hear. it's not a fucking Jackson Pollock painting. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> but but that, that's, the elitism, that's the elitism of it, though, isn't it? Is that, is that you knew. Immediately, but I knew like, because oh. I, I again I understand. I, I mean, I you know I, I, I'm not making any value judgments about Jackson Pollock or, or his his relative merit in the the scheme of painting. But I, I I have looked at his work. I have understood things about the way he makes made images, the way he made pictures, the kind of marks that he made, which again is something that any person who has ever appreciated art it's certainly in the, the western tradition also does i mean you, you, you know classically people who collected um you know drawings um and put them in books i mean they understood oh this this is the kind of line that we expect to see from from again peter paul rubens or anthony van dyke or or, or or anyone else i mean you you do under start to understand the kind of marks the kind of concerns that an artist make that doesn't change because it's Jackson Pollock or, you know, uh, anyone else, you know. Uh, and, and again, that comes from a kind of appreciation or kind of in, in information. And again, I'm not making a, a, a value judgment about, uh, uh, here, but I do think that it, it isn't wrong to expect people to think about things a little more deeply. I mean, again, my fundamental question is why should Paul Joseph Watson, why, why should cultural production be 
easily comprehensible to Paul Joseph Watson? Why is that the metric? Why is the man in the street? Why should I care what the average man in the street with his his coronavirus mask? You know, uh, uh, why should I care what he thinks about anything? You know, well, I, I, one, one thing. I, one thing I would say to that to that point is that uh, again, if you look at traditional art, it's about um, there. There is something here about the purpose of art. What what was it used for? And again, it, it was typically done for th one of three things: for the focus on the transcendence. So again, helping people believe the unbelievable. That's why the church was so tied to art. If you've got a picture of a biblical scene, it's easier to understand it. So art does have a art does have a purpose with people. So there's the transcendent, the moralistic. You know, art, art can teach us moralistic lessons. So for example, the idea of heroism in uh, Greek uh, Greek classical. Uh, art is something, again, that um, Spengler keeps going on about all, all, all the time, that these statues show us what the hero should be. It's not like we're, we're, infalli we're um, fallible, we're going to make mistakes, but actually that perfect um, statue shows us what the hero is going to be like. And then the, th the third kind of use that art has is purely utilitarian, you know, something like, um, you know, you're just informing someone of something almost like agitprop. And um, I, I guess to hit to his point, um, you know, you, do you, did, you said that, um, you know, all of these guys are focusing on the transcendent still. I'm, I'm really not sure, again, especially if you look at the Futurist Manifesto or um, Duchamp, um, what a lot of modern art t turns into is a focus on this, this purely utilitarian piece. And evolved from that is the idea. You know, it's, the, 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 it, it's not about the beauty of the art piece, but it's about the idea that the, the art piece stands for. And it's at that third level of usefulness of art. And I think that's, uh, and, and, and again, going back sorry, to the original point is, you know, why is that important for people? Well, because, you know, artists, you know, um, they sort of bridge the transcendent. They're super important in society and we need them to, 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 teach, uh, to teach your COVID, cough, your, your kufas, what heroism is like. That's how we see, you know, we, we see what a good king's like in, in Henry V. You know, we read um, whatever the Christmas Day speech and we, you know, we're inspired to be, an, to, to be an Englishman again. That's the, that's the power of art. And I guess to PJW's concern is that th they're not interested in doing that. They're interested in, in selling a whole load of cheap ideas instead. Okay, okay but I mean, uh, then I think, well, isn't didacticism in itself often an issue like i mean there's a thin line isn't there from pushing let's say a roman heroic values and let's just say social justice values it's just which values are being pushed are you know it, it's the principle still the same the art is yeah, being no, no, this is this is rubbish moral rel relativism Oh, if, you, okay. if, if, if you believe in in truth, surely, what, do you know what I'm saying? If you believe in truth and beauty, then it's attainable. That, that there is something to be aiming for. Again, this is uh, this is part of the subjectiveness, subjectivism that he was talking about. In in in, in a world where there is no uh, moral absolute, then you then you're right. You know, the, the SJW view of the world is equal to um, you know true true heroism. Well, okay. But, but then the question becomes like again. What, who is the arbiter of this of this truth? I mean, okay, so take take an example from from long in the past. If you take like the Venetian the Venetian artists uh, versus the Florentine artists, you know, uh, would you choose you know um, uh, Michelangelo or would you choose Titian? Um, you, you know, to, but, but and, and this was a contentious question at the time. You had the disegno and you had the colorito. The disegno being the Florentines and the colorito being the the, the Venetians. And the, the, there were you know heated sort of battles amongst people who cared about these things as to which was the proper approach and which was decadence, which was which was getting at the truth of of of, of the sublime line uh, you know of, of, of humanism and in which. Uh, was was mere sensation, you know, and and so again, I think it, it's very easy to stand and look and look into the past and say, oh well, all of the, you know, here's here's Titian and here's Michelangelo, both great, both examples of 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 eternal truths, but that is not how they were seen at the time, you know. I mean, it's very easy to kind of stroll through a museum, stroll through the centuries, stroll through cultures, and assume that there is a narrative and that there is a kind of line that you can follow from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. But I, I, that just isn't how 
it worked. It isn't how art ever worked. And I, I just think that this, in, the question itself is a kind of modern invention. And, and again, if you want to say that that's relative in it, relativism and it's rubbish, but I think that, I, I think it's undeniable at this point. I, I just don't think that you could ever come up with, with a kind of um, primary, uh, you know, uh, sort of definition of what, what true what truth in art is you know i think it's always going to be a question it's always going to be a matter of the tastes and and values of the time and the and the struggles against those if 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 people think that they're corrupted uh and, and I, I think it was ever thus you know um I, but, I, I, you know, I mean, perhaps I, I, I'm, again perhaps i'm so sort of saturated in in kind of you know postmodern degradation that i that i can no longer see the truth either but i, I don't think so yeah, well, well, I mean, I mean, what you're both espousing is like classic postmodernism here. I mean, what, 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 what? I think, I think the most s simple, basic arguments for, um, um, like an eternal beauty would be things like the piano scale, for example. If you combine a root note and the fifth of that note to everyone, it sounds good, no matter who they are. It doesn't matter if you like. I, I mean, I don't think they've ever, ever done it before. There are um, structural and mathematical harmonies in the universe which are beautiful but and for example if you were to play a note and then uh was it like a semitone next to it is you've got that clashing sound that's horrible that no one wants to hear and and you know that, that that's what i would point to and say look there, there are these universal mathematic uh, mathematical beauties that uh, that are true and so um you know regarding a point with with titian and michelangelo i would rather have two two people um who said this is what I think um, beauty is and, and truth. And this other guy saying, this is what I think this beauty and truth is. And them fighting together in an epic battle, as opposed to hundreds of these artists saying, well, you, you do you, you do you, you know, what you, what you do is good. You know, that's fine. Um, and that's the situation we have now. We, 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 need the, we need conflict between people to say, I think this is good. We need um, people who believe in those truths because that's how you, get, how, how you grow them further, I think. But I think we have that. I mean, again, I think we're, we're doing it right now. And I think we, people have done it all through history. You know, I, I think that another thing that, that should also be brought up, uh, since I was talking about the idea of a person strolling through the museum, is that, that I think a lot of people have a very kind of blinkered sense of what actually art history was like. What you see in a museum is not a representation of... of what was happening in the arts around various times. What you see is a very, very, very selective kind of view. There has always been shit art. There was shit art in the 15th century. There was shit art in the 17th century. The thing is that, as you, I think, Pharaoh, you mentioned earlier, like you, you can't appreciate a building until 500 years have passed. Well, the same thing sort of happens in art. I mean, time is a ruthless winnerer of shit. And I think a lot of shit uh, uh, whether it's from the 14th century or the the 19th century, is has already disappeared. It's in the it's deep in the storerooms, or it's been destroyed, or it's in the the the, the attic of a country house. Uh, you know, we you don't tend to see the things that didn't kind of uh, confirm the the you know the tastes of the cognoscenti or, or the curators or the collectors of the time you only see the cream of the crop so there is this kind of narrow sense that well look at how good everything was in the past all of these things i'm strolling through all of these rooms in the, in the museum everything looks so good well of course it looks good because they've selected the good things um so i again i think that you know you, you that there is just this idealized vision that we are living in an age of decadence when I don't think that's true. You can get, in fact, you know, you can go out right now and find people who are painting in uh, certain, within certain traditions of perspective and line and color and complexity, uh, you know, just as there were in the 18th century, you can find people, people to this day, if you wish to look for them. And then we can argue about, well, what does this do? How does this, 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 how, how, how does this represent truth? And and we can have these conversations. I don't think things have, have degraded. In fact, I think it's just, it's far, it's, it's a far larger world than it ever was the art world. Uh, you know, you know, if, if the, if the objective, the objective beauty thing is true, or the or the objective, you know, um, 
like we were talking about, it should be possible to say, well, you know, I'll just um, so so this is a piece by Raphael. It's all right, um, yeah. but but I I mean <laughs> it's I, all right. I, yeah, I, I mean, but <laughs> I, I've I've always thought when I'm having a little wander through, I've always thought, well, you know, for me, Caravaggio seems a lot better. I mean, look at look at the detail there. Look at the light. Look at the exciting things going on. Look at the the skull. Look at the so 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 for me, I've always thought, well, Caravaggio speaks to my speaks to me in a way that Raphael doesn't. I when I when I look at Raphael stuff, I think, oh well, everybody looks a bit pudgy, and it's all just it's just uh, virgin with child again and again and again. Whereas yeah, well, there's well, really interesting well, stuff going on here. So. What I would say is that there's many forms of beauty, but there's only one form of crap. And again, going back to the piano analogy, I, again, I don't know how many people are musicians. But for example, the difference between like a suspended chord or a, a major and a minor chord, they've all, they're all beautiful, but they've all got their different inclinations. The minor is that kind of mel melancholy feel. The suspended has that kind of angst and, and, and energy to it. And, and again, I, I, like, I, I think you can have, like, I, I do think there is, um, you know, objective beauty, but I think there, there is different kinds of, of, of objective beauty. Again, going back to Burke again, he split beauty into... Um, sublimity and beauty in his mind sublimity is these kind of large uh, epic epic things while beautiful things are kind of small and smooth and so he would describe a, a woman as beautiful because she's small and smooth and a, and a mountain as uh, sublime so uh, yeah but why yeah, the, be what the I... beautiful and the sublime yeah that, and that was a big tenet of romanticism in, you know but, but, in the 19th what, century what i'm hearing here though is a kind of well all right. If it if if we're judging um, modern art, um, then we can then we can make these grand claims about uh, capital T truth and objectivity and so on. But if it's Raphael versus Caravaggio, well, we must we must give them both their due. And there's a so there's yeah. a weird there's a what I'm trying to say is though when I when I pull up that comparison, and it was completely at random. Um, yeah. The Car I, you know I like Caravaggio. Um, it, it, I hear a relativism there. It's like saying, oh, well, we can't just, diss uh, Raphael. I mean, he's, just, he's Raphael, put, for God's sake. Just you know? put a piece of modernist art at the end of there. Look, there you go. You've got Raphael Caravaggio and put a modernist at the end and see what people think. You know, that's... Okay, but uh, I, I, something interesting I wanted to ask you about uh, is that I think one of the things that lurks, that lurks in the background of a lot of these, these, these arguments about art is, and I, I, I don't, I self admittedly am not a huge student of economics, but yes. the the labor theory of value. Uh, yeah, I've yeah. always been interested in this idea that that people that people sort of tend to reflexively judge art by the amount of perceived work that went into it, or or um or what you could call the skill theory of value. Yeah, where it's like that, you know. And we've already we've already had a bit of this because I've done a bit of it. I've said, well, he's just stabbing a camphor, canvas, and yep. PJW said it's just a couple of just a couple of uh, squiggly lines. And I even saw Mark uh, in the chat earlier on saying, well, skill can add value to a piece of art. Um, whereas strictly speaking, um it's um it's purely supply and demand and um in the case of art because each piece of art is unique um and, and i mean i'm guessing warhol did like series of prints did he or was each one unique i.e there's uh, they he, he did both he did both edition published editions which uh, you know in 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 the world of prints that the, the idea of an edition is there you know that each oh. each manifestation is the same but he also but all of his pictures were of course all unique even though they seem to be replications so so well you you have a, you have a case then where the supply is always one in, in most or in most cases the supply is just one unique piece in the world and the demand is the total demand Yes, because it's because you're, you're both thinking of it from a materialistic perspective. The value of art in your minds is just the fiscal the fiscal price of it. But that but, was always, but the, uh, to some no, degree, no. that was always the value of it, art. It, I, I'll have to I have to interrupt you here because even if you go back to the, the Middle Ages, when you see these glorious temp panel paintings of depicting you know the Virgin and Child, well, often if you look at the little label there, you'll see that it's the Virgin and Child with saints and donors. 
And who are the donors? Well, the donors are the people who paid to have the painting made. And uh, the, even, in, in, even within that, the donors would often specify, well, I want the most expensive lapis lazuli ultramarine blue to be used in this painting. I want this much gold. I want 15 florins worth of gold to be put on this painting. You know, uh, you go into the, the, the 17th century. Well, you know, I, I want, you know, the, this, this, uh, Peter Paul Rubens painting, you know, it's it's fabulous and, and I'm going to pay this much money for it. I mean, if you look at like the records of Charles I buying art, I mean, it's always been to a degree about the value placed on that art by the market. I'm just thinking of uh, Michelangelo or uh, or Raphael being like, uh, uh, a thank you to my backers and Patreons. A very special thanks to Mr. Gen <laughs> Gen <Jenny Benavolo. laughs> they, they literally did. They literally did. I mean, yeah. again, some of the best the best Renaissance paintings have the patron at the centre of the works. So look, I, I, again, I don't, I don't deny it. But the whole point of labour theory of value is it's the price paid for the like the material uh, ob object in itself. And I, I would say that you know, does it this what skill does? I think uh, it does change the transcendent value, and I don't think that's included as part of. The, uh, the purely materialistic economic no, labor theory value. No, I, I'm afraid it's not materialistic though, because the the price in the way that we're talking about it here is simply a number that is put on the um, it, on uh, people's subjective value scales in aggregate. So if you if you have a market where um, let's say there are a thousand people who really really like this one piece of art, they can keep on bidding up the price. If um if they don't really like it and if they don't think subjectively it's transcendent, they're not going to fork out four point ten you know four point nine million pounds for uh, one painting. It will find its. I mean the Wu the Wu Tang Clan did it, didn't they? They they released um they released a, um an album where there was a single um a single copy of it. Uh, in fact, they were copying the residents. Uh, interestingly, who who are another kind of avant garde uh, strange band that um. From the from from the from the late sixties and the and the seventies that I like, they did it first, where they just released one copy in a vault, and then the Wu Tang Clan did it. And I can't remember it was that it was that millionaire kind of troll guy who uh, who, who bought oh, it in Shakrelli, Shakrelli, yes, right. But but whatever that whatever price he paid was basically de facto the revealed the revealed market price of that piece because nobody in the world was willing to pay more than him. Um, wh wh whereas you, I can imagine certain artists uh, doing the same trick as the Wu Tang Clan, and there being a bidder who was higher than that millionaire troll because they value whoever. It, let's pretend it was Adele who did it. I can imagine. I can imagine Adele would fetch a, Adele's unique album would probably face, you know, fetch a higher face value price than the Wu Tang Clan's, uh, which is to say nothing about what my views are on each of them. I'm just saying that the. Yeah. The subjective valuations of the world are captured in that price. Yeah, I, I, I guess I, I think maybe I didn't explain myself properly there. Um, you, you, you're right, but it depends on the people that's in the marketplace. And, and in my mind, the people in the marketplace don't care so much for the transcendent value anymore. And therefore, because they don't care about the transcendent value, skill is less, less of an issue and less important to them. You know, that, that, that's, can, can we use the monetary price of a piece of art as um, an identifier of its worth, but th but then we're we're no better then than a than essentially a leftist sneering at the fact that the plebs like to go and watch Michael Bay films and Transformers. Um, you know, you get the, the snooty film critic who says, "Oh, actually, they should be watching this French art house movie that I like. They should be made to," which is which is the imp which is the impetus behind a lot of that. All I see here is. Is uh, you know whether it's Roger Scruton or or PJW or somebody else basically saying, well, my preference is for this sort of art, and the and the you know the select audience who buys this sort of thing doesn't follow my taste. That's that's all. That's all. That, I mean, in a purely economic way of looking at it, that's what I would see. You know, and, and, and this sort of cultural populism, I think leftism lurks behind it, and I think I've always been suspicious of it for that reason because it, it, it again. And, and you'll hear, I mean, Paul Joseph Watson did it in that video. The, the average person, the man in the street, you know, normal people, you know, this, this sort of appeal to, to kind of the, the proletariat. I mean, he, that, he could just use that word because that's exactly what he's talking about. 
Yeah, and that, that's that's um, that's also why I was always a little bit sniffy or or a little bit suspicious of things like the Brexit Party or um, what's that woman's name? You know, Claire Fox and the Spike Crowd and Brendan O'Neill. I've got nothing against Claire Fox. I've I have I have in fact I've spoken at events for for, for Claire Fox. Uh, you know, perfectly perfectly good uh, person, but. Uh, that point that you made b behind this leftism lurks, I think is true. It, it's a kind of dem it's this idea of democratization and, you know, the uh, the taste of the peasantry essentially should be the one that prevails, which is essentially a Jacobin sentiment, isn't it? It's, it's a kind of um, or, or it's a it's a it's a. <sighs> I, I don't. It's not necessarily a hierarchical sentiment, is it? It's, it's one. It's one that says, "Oh well, the man in the pub's view should prevail over the, over over the um over the person who's been to art college, essentially." Yep. So, and anyway, shall we shall we continue? Um, yep. let's uh let let's keep on because I, I think these are interesting things that are never talked about ever. You know, so um we um I think it's important to tease them out a little bit to to separate um. To separate some of the spits that we 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 sometimes see, quote unquote, on the right. So let's see where PJW. We've already got one, two minutes into this. So <laughs> far. Let's, uh, let's leave him roll for a while, shall we? Art snobs explain to us the genius of someone like Matisse by claiming that the invention of photography made it necessary for artists to be more imaginative and less realist. Bullshit. Ron Muir. Oh God. <laughs> Do you, want to, do you want to defend Matisse? I don't think I'm, I'm. I don't think I'm going to be able to make it through this. Video. <laughs> There's an interesting I mean, point here. What? Is, uh, 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 sorry, you get you get it. Uh, no. I, I don't. I don't know where to start. I mean, first of all, he does bring up a point that there is one of the theories about why uh, arts changed fundamentally in the 19th century. Uh, was the invention of photography. And I think that's undeniable. I think that you cannot... Uh, I'm not saying that that was the only cause, but I would say that that was a very large cause. So uh, before that, I mean, there, there were strata, just as the th there, there are now. I mean, there were the sort of giants of art, you know, so you take someone, in, you know, like take the 18th century, you take in Britain, you take like Joshua Reynolds or, or, or George Romney or uh, um, uh, you know, various portrait painters. Okay, so the, only the, the richest sort of people are going to, to be able to commission those artists to do their portrait but then like in every town or every sort of major town there will also be portrait artists you know who i mean maybe just just as good or, or certainly approaching that, that the level of skill of some of these great people but they're not not as well known they're they're more local artists and those people would would then the gentry people who you know who who perhaps have slightly lesser means would go to them to to have their portraits painted or they would buy landscapes from these these artists and then you know the the, the, the heavy hitters would buy landscapes from from the heavy hitter artists you know so there was all this whole market and so but then suddenly uh when with the advent of photography um which spread you know after certain technical developments had spread quite rapidly. One of the biggest uses of photography was portraits. Um, and suddenly, almost anyone could afford to have a portrait taken. And in fact, there were itinerant people who would go around in wagons with the whole l l l uh, dark room and the camera, and they would, they would take people's portraits. So suddenly, there was no, no more need for the, certainly for the lower uh, end of the market, the, the 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 local portrait artists, it just just wasn't required because you know why would you spend that amount of money to have your portrait done when you could just you know you could have the photograph done. Now it's still there. There was still some demand for this, but the demand greatly reduced. You know, so suddenly this whole sector of 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 you know of 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 an industry. Uh, disappeared within 20 years um and and so it's, it's sort of undeniable that this this was a huge seismic shock you know i mean just again great swathes of people who had been interested in art who'd, who'd had that as a vocation were suddenly not really needed for their abilities to 
to do a portrait of someone, so to speak. So, um, it, my my question would be though, why is why is PJW suddenly using realism as the benchmark? Um, because it, well, because that is again that is something that the kind of ill informed person always falls back upon is the idea well it has to look if it looks real it's good and i mean that's it's certainly a, a, there's a legitimate idea there and and that is a, again a, a whole strain of artists and and one which continues i mean even in the the postmodern era there was a whole movement called photorealism which was basically how how closely uh, can you paint a picture to look like a source photograph and and you know there were so many sort of great paintings produced yeah. in in that in that in that that I should little, um, view. I, but I should make something clear that my um I don't like Caravaggio because he looks a bit more photorealistic than all the others. I like him because it's dark and it's got really obvious symbolism that I can get my teeth stuck into. And, yeah, and it's, 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 it's dramatic, and it's dramatic, you and, know? and it and it's dramatic, which when I it's got like skulls in it and like goats and things like that um which, which you know speak, speaks, speaks to my sensibilities but um but i'm sure if you showed like a, a dali painting to pjw he would like that now that's yeah. not realistic in the same way but it's mm. um you know it's got really obvious symbolism and i like dali because guess what yeah. it's got really obvious symbolism which i can get my yeah. teeth stuck into um yeah. so, so it's clearly not realism. Is the th that's not really the thing that he's railing against. He's railing against abstract art, isn't he? Well, he and, and because again, if you take the example of Matisse, Matisse had a very long career, and there's you can basically find a period of Matisse's work in almost every style. Matisse did did certainly, you know, perfectly quote realistic things. I hate that word, by the way. Um, but you know, as well as that, you know, he showed that little flash there of a of a kind of a particular Matisse. I I I don't recall which one it was, but again, you know, that that sort of so he's basically sort of leveling Matisse to, to you know and saying that this entire career, all the developments, all all the developments, all the changes, all the transformations that this artist made. Are kind of invalid because it doesn't look real. This one painting, it, no, does, it doesn't look, it doesn't look quote real. I, th I think um, you guys are understanding his point here. What he was saying was um, the uh, an excuse that a lot of modern artists use for their change in style was m m m photography, basically. And what he's what he's saying is that that's not re the real reason. And again, just to your point, just to your point, Mister D. Um, you, you, you're, you're right in the fact that photography wiped out an entire strata of art, but all I'd say, even still, the majority of the art is all um, you know, highly abstracted, even even at that time. So I think using the excuse of uh, photography, photography's here, so we can't do realism anymore. It just doesn't make any sense, but it's often touted as the reason for for modernism. In my, in my mind, it doesn't make any sense. It's a straw man, and I, I, I again, yeah, I, I would agree that 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 idea is a straw man. I'm I'm saying that photography did have a a, a, a very deep effect upon the way people thought about imagery, oh, yeah. imagery, but that is not the cause. And and no, I don't I don't know a single artist. I'm sure sure you could probably find one, but and certainly Matisse, as far as I know, never spoke about photography uh, and its effect on his art. And 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 in reality, he came you know, 50 years after photography's advent. So um, to say that that was the reason for Picasso or something like that, I mean, that, that's, it's, it's just sort of silly. I mean, yes, it did have a great impact in the 19th century and it did call, cause a certain crisis amongst the certain sector of the, of the art market. But, you know, again, it's just, it's just this reductive idea of boiling everything down to the most inflammatory points and then shrieking it you know, while staring into the camera, it just, it just. I, uh. Now, I, I, I do want to, I do have my own gripes with Matisse. Um, and this is nothing actually to do with his actual art and more for um, a, a current trend, I would say, uh, for, I don't know if you hear this um, phrase, like a naive art or a naive pattern mm -hmm. um, where everything looks a little bit childish. Um, there was a little period where like, uh, Everybody went a bit wild for like buying tiles with naive patterns on them, or yeah. like, uh, and um, I blame. I, I think I blame Matisse for that. <laughs> I, I I think I blame that. I think I blame this this desperate flailing for quote authenticity. Again, I think that, that at the root of, of that 
that sort of desire for for folk art and and and, and naive art is is this weird kind of fetish fetishization of of the idea of the authentic artist oh with this is an un, 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 untrained artist you know this is this is a, someone real you know uh i i think that had sort of little to do with matisse and and uh <laughs> and and more to do with more to do with this just again with this this fetish of right. the of of the uh, of the authentic experience. So just just on just on photography, can I ask? Do you, do you consider photography to be art? It depends upon the photographer. I mean, absolutely. Uh, there there are many uh, photographers and uh, whose work I would absolutely consider art of the highest order. So, I like it. I like photography too. I've been to a few yeah. photography exhibits. Um, I especially like the one of um, uh, there was a guy who followed Tony Blair around and took a lot of the very famous pictures of um, Blair and uh, Mandelson and uh, what's his name, uh, Alistair Campbell, all sitting around their yeah. little their little. Uh, that was a fascinating one, and some of the photos were even though they were of historical and political importance, they were actually good photos as well. So uh, that was one that was one I would uh, recommend. Um, but most of the time, it's extreme close-ups of Native Americans and things like that that you, that you tend to get in a lot of these things. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this is my trip to Cuba, and here's the extreme close-up of an old man from, who's been living yeah. in Casper's Cuba. Um, I, I don't. I don't want to get into photography so much because it's a sort of a side note. But I mean, it is an interesting kind of study because it it is a medium which was very quickly accessible to ev almost everyone in society. Everyone could have a camera, and so and yet, sort of figure like great figures did emerge uh, am am among that, and that, that's very interesting to me that that, that even the most kind of democratized medium which you know you can produce a decent photograph with no with little skill uh in some circumstances that that, that, that still yeah. became a kind of uh strata of of of, of art uh, within that uh of course we, we could say we could say say the same about the art of youtubing uh of which of course pjw is the preeminent master um, having 1.84 million subscribers, I mean, maybe maybe there's a reason he makes reductive mm. points in a shouty manner because it kind of. Uh, I mean, look, well, this, this, this it's, video it's not about the number. Again, you're missing out. You know, it's not the number. It's about the transcendent power of a PowerPoint presentation YouTube video. That's the true transcendence there. <laughs> 3D, 3, 3D rotate. Yeah. Okay. Let's keep. Okay. Let's, I'm going to try to. I'm going to try to. I'm going to hold my tongue. I'm not. I'm going to try not to interrupt for a while. Can we see if we can go more than 20 seconds? Okay, good. Hyper-realist works that the art world has ever seen. Yet it's Matisse who is embraced by the art establishment, while to a large extent, Muek is shunned. So again, it goes back to elitism. The general public loves Muek because he's massively talented and his works are stunning. But the snooty art establishment loves Matisse because they can pretend to be intellectually superior to the general public <laughs> by waffling on about... Now, now, can I just say, is it, is it true that the art world shuns this guy? No! Th th again, he's just th 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 absolutely false. Ron Muick is, is a very, very highly recognised, uh, very frequently written about. Uh, it, it, a, a part of almost every major collection of contemporary art in the world and commands huge prices in the, the secondary market as well as it's a primary market and that's just a, it's an outright right lie to say that ron muick is is shunned and matisse is embraced in fact it's quite the opposite i i i, I would i would i would challenge paul joseph watson to go amongst the sort of contemporary art gallery world and get people to 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 talk glowingly about matisse matisse is again a reactionary, probably considered a reactionary in certain circles. Uh, you know, so again, he, he's just just an outright falsehood there. Um, yeah. See, I, I do, I, I do, we we got twenty <laughs> seconds. <laughs> I do like the idea that what that, that Watson is a massive fan of this guy, though. It's like, oh, right. I know. He, and I, he, I, I, I quite like I, I quite like Ron Muir's work, but I mean, again, I mean, you know. Uh, it's something. It's something strange. He's 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 sort of bothered by like you know that 
I don't know what it was, that horrible woman vomiting in the in the gallery. He's bothered by that, but he's not bothered by a gigantic, uh, uh, you know, mucus-covered infant in, in in an art gallery. I mean, this is the man who was just talking about, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the sort of returning to these great values of art. I mean, <laughs> you know, and here's a, here's a, here's a, here's a naked middle, you know, here's a, here's a tiny statue of a naked middle-aged man with his flaccid penis flopping out in the art gallery. And Paul Joseph Watson is all for that. <laughs> Very do strange. Want to, do you want to defend your man, Farrow, on this point? Uh, no, I think I think I think I think D is one hundred percent right here, basically. But uh, I mean, I, I couldn't I couldn't say about the shunning, um, but I, like I, I'm not I, I'm not see, particularly I, enamoured by his work. So I, I wonder if PGW threw this in as if to say, "Listen, I'm not a philistine. I know what I'm talking. I've got the shunning <laughs> taste." Yeah, <laughs> and, and there's, 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 there's again that. Those Ron Muick pieces, are, they're, they're, they're amazing, you know, and, and I quite like them. I, I, I can't say that I, I find the same value uh, because I'm a, I'm a painter, uh, you know, so uh, my, my, I, I would tend towards, you know, Matisse more than Ron Muick. But I, I certainly I, I think that these, these, some of these pieces are quite powerful and they are skillful, you know, for, for if that's a, a metric. So I, I don't know why you, there, there's this one or the other game being played here very very strange but he's he's absolutely wrong when he says that ron muick is shunned that that is not true let's keep on going about the pathos and the intricacy of a bunch of colored squares modern art is literally rubbish from a polystyrene sculpture to a bag of waste paper so-called works of art keep being thrown out because people mistake them for garbage when it becomes impossible to tell the difference between conceptual art and trash, then we know we've crossed the line. It ceases to be. I mean, does, doesn't he have a point? They, they, they literally threw it out because they couldn't tell it was art. It was literally rubbish. Yes? Uh, I, I, I think I know what, people, what that was in reference to. I, don't, I feel like it was... I feel like it was Damien Hurst, but it probably wasn't um, that piece. I mean, yeah, that was one thing that, you know, that went through all the tabloids, you know, so of course Paul Joseph Watson is, is going to notice it because that seems to be the extent of his, uh, his, 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 his reading, but um, uh, yeah, it's fine. You know, and, and again, uh, you, you, to, to, to sort of defend quote modern art is not to, in, to, to embrace every, every practitioner of art. I mean, there is a big difference between Henri Matisse and, you know, uh, the, 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 the bag of rubbish. And literally that piece was sort of rubbish on the floor, you know, um, with a bag. <laughs> That's what it was. Uh, you know, you, you, there, it is not an either or situation. You know, again, it's it just, it's just mixing, it's mixing, universes that have nothing to do with one another um, on, on, on a second here because th again this goes back to that point i was saying earlier about the um egalitarianism of form where any uh, artistic form has has merit and has value to such an extent where even a piece of rubbish has potential potential value that you were backing up earlier so like you, do, you know, do you know what I'm saying? It's, it's the same idea that comes at, at the start of modernism that you can have a piece of trash or an upturned urinal as um, a valuable piece of art. That is the same as the art that gets thrown away. So it's, it's not a separate world. It's part of the same ideological co continuum. So, but, I mean, what, what, what we have established is that PJW likes realism and he doesn't like abstract and uh, he doesn't like anything that doesn't have like actual actual painting involved by, by the looks of things or, or actual sculpture involved uh that so that's his preference scale we've also established that i like heavy and obvious symbolism um and and it's skulls, skulls yeah. uh, and and things uh things that look like they could uh could be in a batman comic i suppose and um <laughs> um uh and uh but we have not, and, we, and Pharaoh has, I mean, he hasn't really said much about his own taste, but he has been defending something about the capital T uh, the tr truth and beauty idea. Where, whereas D, you seem to, you seem to have defended everything so far. So wouldn't some, wouldn't somebody argue, well, if you, if you like everything, in fact, you like nothing, that you're so eclectic 
that you that you embrace so many different styles that that is in fact a lack of taste. Wouldn't somebody like a Brian Sewell say this? I, that's my. That's uh, my <laughs> for Brian Sewell, I love Brian Sewell. Sewell <laughs> by the way, I I, I I actually had a chance to meet him once. But uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, you could certainly make that argument, and there there, there are people who 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 could. It just depends upon your you know your your kind of frame of mind. I mean, what you expect of people. If you expect people to adhere to a consistent sort of um, trajectory of of of, of of artwork, a thought, a style, or something. I, I don't happen to, to. I've never been that way. I mean, again, I, I would say that I, I you know, I, I would emphasize that I am a practitioner of art, and so my experience, what what I appreciate about it, is probably quite different than what someone who who isn't, you know, who isn't an artist, who isn't a painter, kind of appreciates a, about things. I mean, I look at things. You know, in my experience of, of, of things is 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 very sort of very primal. I just I I react to to kind of texture. I react to color. I react to relationships. I react to proportions. You know, I mean, and and I can find those in all sorts of art and uh, through all periods. I mean, you you're absolutely right when you say that you know that I I defend everything because I think that 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 within you can find you know. Uh, could find examples of this great truth in almost any great work of any culture or any person uh from from cave paintings to comics you know uh it, it can be found so i do have quite catholic tastes uh so to speak oh, all right so let's uh, let's let's continue i'm uh, i was just looking for more uh, caravaggio skull paintings <laughs> saint jerome with a skull Okay, let's carry on. Bold, provocative, and daring, and simply becomes a worthless piece of crap. I had my own experience of this when I visited a modern art museum in Lucerne, Switzerland, appropriately named the Kunst Museum. Seeking respite from an onslaught of modern art, you know, a leather jacket spray painted and stuck to the wall, a tape recorder of a man whining about how much he hated his parents, I found somewhere to sit down, only to be sternly told I was sitting on a work of art. A wicker chair painted orange. Seriously, how long before this CBC parody becomes real? And we have people claiming to have created invisible art. It comes down to this. We have to maintain objective standards of quality and talent in order to discern the value of anything. Do you see musicians playing random notes and chords or vocalists singing out of tune and demanding they be taken seriously? Yeah, I'm not talking about Yoko. Do you see figure skaters falling over and demanding that they be given high scores? We rightly ask. <laughs> I mean, is this not a strong argument? He's got a point, D. Uh, I I don't know what what is the point you know that 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 how much how much effort you put I mean again it's back to the labor theory of value you know uh, so so does he what, go what? around the does it, so does he go around like museums and flop in chairs or does he, does he flop down in 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 you know sort of William Kent or, or, or Thomas Chippendale chairs and then and get outraged about the fact that he can't sit in it because it's a work of art no of course not. So what is he on about? I mean, what, what, I, 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 he, he's saying there's an objective st standard. So like in the world of figure skating, you know, it's either a 10 or it's a one or in the world of, uh, in the, what was the other example again? In the world of singing, if you're out of tune, I'm, I'm sorry, Simon Cowell's not going to hire you, son. So if you can't paint, what are you doing in the gallery? That's the argument. Am I wrong, Ferro? Okay, that, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, but 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 but, whoa, but uh, I, I don't know. I I just I don't. I, I, I again. I I'm not interested. You know, if if you don't like a certain mode of cultural practice, then don't patronize it. I mean, I think that the uh, the only way that this has a point is is when the public is being expected to to pay for these things. So, if something is being funded publicly, then I absolutely agree. 
um, you know, it, it becomes a different matter. I happen to think none of it should be funded publicly at all. And then this isn't, it isn't a question. Who cares what the man in the street thinks about it? If he doesn't like it, he can go to another gallery that has the sort of art that he likes, and he can look at it. I mean, again, uh, why, why is he insisting upon reducing everything to this single line of his blinkered, you know, narrow Philistine tastes of, of something that looks real? Oh, I like this because it looks like a real baby. You know, well, that's fine. You know, then patronize the things that you like. But why are you insisting that? that all practice be brought in line with this this uh, this idea of your own taste it's just but, it's, it's ridiculous I, I, I think this is a really interesting idea here and also this sort of goes to aa's latest video on institutions which was excellent everyone should definitely check it out i think it's one of the best for, best of the year but but i guess the point is when i see um all of the kind of art galleries totally captured by, by modernism and postmodernist modernist thinking when you see um all of the funding and the capital like again, I wouldn't want it publicly funded. It's just a fact that that's where the money in the art, art establishment is, and it's going to these ridiculous, ter terrible artists. I personally, you know, I I I want to. I don't go there. I go somewhere else. But it doesn't mean I don't grieve. It doesn't mean I don't mourn for what uh, our once great academy has turned into. Yes, we can build our establishments, but I still want to light a candle for the, the, the desolation that has occurred but, in our country. But then, but then you're 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 tacitly admitting that that. That your that that capital T truth has no power of its own. That it that it can't survive without being coddled like a like a small sick plant. You know, I mean that's a that's a very strange kind of idea. You know, if this great transcendent tr truth is present in work, then why is it not powerful enough to withstand the test of time and overcome? Yoko Ono and you over overcome, you know, or orange wicker chairs in galleries. You know, I mean, why do you have so little faith faith in the power of your, your of the art that you like? Uh, it, this it, is survive again. I, I think it's, we're talking about different things here. If, for example, a uh, imagine a city state decides to remove all artists and institutions. I'm thinking the Spartans, for example. Um, you, you know, the, the, then if, if you're not producing art or not even aiming for transcendence, you'll never achieve transcendence. Maybe if your, uh, if you, if your museums contain transcendence, maybe that seed will be taken and then a next and a, and a further generation. But what I'm saying is that um, the uh, teaching institutions uh, mm -hmm. are, have, all, have all been captured and, and um, destabilizing artists even before they've even thought about transcendence. And again, I, I, do, I, do, I do genuinely wish, uh, you know, and, and, I, and I think that... Uh, um, you know, as time goes on, the institutions will break down. And AA is right in his point about we should be we should be focusing on building our own and our own groups. And you know, I would love to see um, you know more traditional art groups getting getting together and producing works and um, collaborating together. I would love to see that. But but at the same time, I can still be upset and mourn for um, the loss that's happened. Mm. Well, I, I would I would agree with you on on one point in there is that there is a huge problem with institutions and i think that the existence of some of the the more you know kind of um fatuous and 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 kind of uh, meritless if we we can, we can go go that far art is solely due to the subsidizing effect of institutions. And, and a lot of this work would not exist. It wouldn't exist in the commercial world. I mean, a lot of, you know, a lot of this work is not profitable at all uh, in the primary market. You know, um, it produces and says a sensation and therefore it, it, it generates publicity and it's, it's, it's valuable in that way, but it isn't, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't earn in the long run. It doesn't earn a great amount of money. And so a lot of it would disappear if it weren't subsidized by various institutions. And so I, I do agree that uh, uh, it's not going to make Matisse disappear. You know, there will always be a, a market de demand for that. But but again, without the artificial subsidy of various institutions and, and what they represent, then then you're right. I, I, I think that that a lot of these things would disappear. And I, I do think you're right. And I was being slightly facetious when I said, that, you know, great art which should be able to survive on its own. I mean, it, it, there is an active, there is an, is an active force 
within that it is embedded deeply with now within all of the institutions in the West that is is actually trying to to to, to subvert and destroy these her this heritage. And so I, I do think there is a great cause for concern. But again, I think uh, the, the, the revealed preference, if it were allowed to manifest itself, if it weren't uh, kind of subverted by, by institutions, by top-down kind of control by these institutions, it, it would come into effect and, 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 and the shit would, would, as it always has, would drain away. Um, uh, all right. Well, in the interest of time, we will we will continue the uh, the, the review. This is all very interesting. Um, I am reminded, though, of Ro Roger Scruton in one of his books. Um, I think it's the one uh, called Where We Are. Um, he basically says that um, you need um, the state in some way to protect certain things. I, in fact, he was talking about architecture. Um, because the market of its own volition would end up erecting giant, uh, you know, glass and steel monstros monstrosities, essentially. Um, that was his argument in the architecture realm. Uh, I mean, Farah, what do you think of that uh, before we move yeah, on? There's an interesting similarities with some of Ruskin's view on that. And his, his claim is that the, um, the, the, the quality of art is directly related to the, the, uh, the moral ability of a nation. That is that if all of the elite are corrupted, they're going to ask for corrupted art at the same time. And I think that that's where the place that like a top um, that a top down state has um, on the cultural perspective is guiding it and, and you know, trying to push towards um, something that's better. So, you know, I, I, th I think I, I would agree with him. Let's keep on going that the artist has perfected his craft. Piling up pieces of dung and straw on a cheap top doesn't take skill or craft. It took Michelangelo three years to carve his iconic David out of a rock. It took considerably less time and skill for the LA County Museum of Art to provide us with a rock. Yes, that's it. <laughs> So, I mean, we we have just had the labor theory and the skill theory of value there, but hasn't he got a point? I mean, it's just a rock, D. Or, 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 I, don't, or, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know that particular piece, so I, I can't can't comment on that. I mean, you know, I, 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 certainly, he's, he's uh, there's uh, there's undeniable uh, there's undeniable value in, in in Michelangelo, but again, to reduce Michelangelo to to I mean, again, just this idea of a of a, of a of a, of a productive worker, which is basically what he's doing, is disgusting. You know, I'm, I'm frankly but, offended by that 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 suggestion that Michelangelo's value is in the fact that it took him three years to carve that 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 sculpture. You know, that that's that's. I mean, that is the insult. Uh, but, but there's, not there's not that rock, thing, whatever it is. There's an interesting thing here because again, going back to Ruskin's point, the corrupt generation doesn't see the value in skill. And and that's and that's his point is that the corrupt. This is why I feel like the this whole LTV thing is a bit. You've got to be careful about it because when comparing the the um, the, the, the value of David at the time versus the value of you know the, the price. Sorry, the price that the, the patron paid for David versus someone paying for that rock. You know, you're dealing with two different sets of people. And I would say that the you know we we have the corrupt generation that sees value in a rock and doesn't see the value in skill. But, but who, who sees value in that rock? I mean, that 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 is a good question. I mean, again, I think that that a lot of what the, the people are setting up these straw mans. So look, everyone is supporting this this rock. Well, an institution is supporting that rock, and the people are making the decisions within that institution. You know, uh, whoever funded that. Okay, those people are supporting that rock. But I mean, are are, are critics clamoring for this work is is anyone saying that this this whatever this work is 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 equivalent to michelangelo i, I don't think so i mean again i think people are, it, it is a tendency of people uh, I, I, well, not just the tendency of people on the right but certainly in the, in the context of art it seems to be to set up these straw mans as if everyone in the world is falling over themselves with this rock and everyone is forgetting about michelangelo's david i don't think that's the case at all I mean, yes, this this exists, and an institution paid for it, but that that's done nothing to alter the status of of David. So, why are we making this comparison? You know, three hundred and I guarantee you, I, I guarantee you, this this rock is going to be forgotten. 
uh, within a short amount of time. And the money that they waste on this shite. Ten million dollars for a frigging rock. Half a million dollars for a lamppost ring in Calgary. That's the gross thing, is that tax dollars go to support this. They have one exhibit that's all junk. It's called junk. It's like part of the name of the exhibit. And you go there, it's like bottle caps that are glued to like a cork board. Like, you fucks. You motherfuckers, you, you put this on a frame and, and hung it on the wall and you actually are charging people to see this dog shit. I mean, just total dog shit. Conceptual art also reflects trends in society, culture and politics. This is what happens when lefty social justice warriors and cultural Marxists seize control of something and ruin it for everyone else. No wonder gay. Any truth to these claims here? That I mean, in in the case of the rock, you could say, well, Marx has got a hold of it, and now they're paying for a rock. But is this is, is this really what's happened? Do we think? Yes. For for for, for the museums, I think obviously uh, Marxists have taken control, and they're they're doing things like the post colonial theory, like like D said. Again, this is this is my concern about some of the institutional capture is that so, something like the VNA has got uh, you know timeless classics that can't be replaced. And at best, they're just going to archive them, so we never see them. You're never going to be able to experience transcendence, or at worst, they're going to be they'll be they'll try and flog them and replace them with some low tier uh, BLM uh, activist artist um, in, instead. And, and I think that's the kind of situation where building your own institution, you know, you, you can't you can't replace um, like national art. Yeah, no, no, that, that is true. That is true. Yeah, and, 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 and I think, I, I think, uh, I, you know, again, I would, I would go even further than that. Is that we, we can't just uh, uh, because these institutions are captured, uh, which they are. I mean, you, you, you could see it at the British Library, the, the head librarian of the British Library, talking about about re reimagining the trajectory of of the collections of the British Library, but uh, based on r r these racial theories. I mean, we can't abandon. Be because the it's like with the BBC you mentioned once AA we can't yeah. abandon the institutions we have because they possess the physical objects the entire history of our our culture and 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 many other cultures as well in their collections and so we we can't just say okay fair enough they've won so let's build our own little right wing institution we can't let them have this it is not their heritage to destroy it is our heritage so uh, i i agree we need institutions of our own but we also need to recapture these other institutions as well we cannot we cannot cede our uh, our uh, the object heritage of our culture to these people i i i i i i cannot let, allow that to happen and i don't think anyone can allow that to happen so yes i, I agree on on both points and and, and i think pjw uh, out of everything he said, he's he's most right about that point. Um, that there is there is a great danger. Them subverting the video games industry. Conceptual art is another front in the war on objectivism. It's this ridiculous idea that something has merit and authenticity based on the flimsiest subjective pretense. Just as a 52-year-old man can identify as a six-year-old girl and demand that society embrace his delusion, the art world presents us with 90 tin cans filled with feces ah. and demands that we treat it with reverence. <sighs> Correct or not? I, I was wondering when we were going to get to Piero Manzoni because it's always going to come up. <laughs> so uh, just, just a quick aside, for those who, who don't know what, what that Pit, that photograph is. There was an artist named Piero Manzoni, Italian artist, who who um, worked in the 1950s, 1960s. He died quite young, I think, in the mid 1960s. Uh, but he produced probably he produced a lot of lot, various works of art, including some lots of uh, kind of textural um, uh, kind of monochromatic panel um, pictures, sculptural panel pictures. But his most infamous art is that there, and that. Uh, that is called artist shit, um, merda de artista, I think in Italian, um, and it was a series of tins which said 
artist shit. This contains, you can read the label there. I don't remember exactly what it said. This contains a certain quantity of, uh, of the artist shit. Um, and, but again, the question remains, well, what, what, what is this? I mean, was he producing this work to, and saying that it was a part of the great continuum of art was Manzoni himself producing this as as something to compete with Michelangelo? Well, no. I mean, just as as, as you know, we look at something like like uh, uh, you know various characters like James Gilray or or Cruikshank or uh, or Hogarth, we understand that their work was meant, at least some of their work was meant to satirize. To, to, to kind of comment upon British institutions of the of the late 18th century. And, and, and I think there's a case to be made that that is what Manzoni was doing. But again, we're, we're forced to kind of level everything together. Well, just because it's called art and just because it's in a museum or is, 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 is being sold at an, an art auction, that then we have to say, well, we have to compare this to Michelangelo. And that's just nonsense. I mean, this was a very specific statement that one artist was was making at a particular time that was, in effect, actually, in a way, taking the side of of Paul Joseph Watson and saying, "Well, <laughs> this this yeah. this this pathetic this this art world, so to speak, uh, y- you can literally monetize sh- literal shit." You, they will they will sell it it will become valuable uh, because and, and so again I, you know you you can dismiss manzoni but I think he's actually on on side for people who say well they're literally selling things of no value at all and and making them valuable and and it's absolutely true those tins of artist shit now sell for hundreds of thousands of pounds. Uh, the other interesting thing, of course, is that none of them actually contain shit, uh, as far as we know. Uh, there have been ones that have been opened, and there is no feces in them. They're, they're packed with <laughs> plaster and, and <laughs> cotton. So it's a lie. On top of being a scathing criticism, it was also a lie, which I think is quite, is, is quite, quite cleverly diabolical. So it, again, uh, you know, y- yes, you could, it, without any information... You could be outraged by that. But when you kind of look into the, the history of it, you can see what it was. It was commentary. It was not competing with classical art. It was a, it was commentary. It was a certain strand of an artist's practice, you know. What, so, What do you, th- what do you think of that defense, Pharaoh? What do you think of that defense? Again, I think it's interesting. This is what I was going back to earlier when I was talking about the three uses of art, the transcendent, the moral, and the utilitarian. You know, satire is, uh, I would say, is like a utilitarian usage of art so i i would still call this actually ironically an art piece but just probably like the lowest form of art possible you know it's not something that's focusing on the transcendent or teaching us trying to teach us a a moral lesson here it's just trying to just trying to satirize ultimately um there's also an interesting thing here around um again the 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 value of art being in the idea as opposed to beauty again, because this isn't a beautiful object. It's not focusing on trying to, again, create sublimity or, or whatever. It's the, the value of it is inside its utilitarian purpose of um, satirization. But ironically, I, I would probably still call this art just the very lowest form possible. And, and again, I think my, my issue with this isn't necessarily that it was created or that it's even um, put on show. It's just that, um, you know, this is my, my issue with it, with it is, is that we flipped the axis of uh, the usage of art where the utilitarian, the, the idea of the art is the most important thing and the beauty is the, is the least important thing. All right, let's, uh, let's carry on going. Uh, we're almost at the end of this now. And then I'll do the and then I'll do the super chats if uh, you chaps have time. Um, well, I'm not going to treat it with reverence. I'm going to objectively argue that it's ninety pieces of shit and it's not art. Oh, but it's so shocking and offensive to submerge Jesus in piss. How ah, great there we go. It? No, it's not. It's just a lame cliche. If you really want to be offensive, why don't you start drawing life-size cartoons of my? All right, that'll do. <laughs> I, uh, uh, <laughs> 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 crazy, crazy. Very good. But soon come to a grinding halt. So, what happens when people within the art world 
speak out about the vacuousness of modern art. Well, they get publicly shamed and fired. Ivan Massow, the chairman of the Institute of Contemporary Art, was dismissed when he dared to suggest that the art establishment had, quote, disappeared up its own arse. Massow described conceptual art as, quote, pretentious, self-indulgent, craftless tat that I wouldn't accept even as a gift. And he's completely right. But to utter that the emperor has no clothes is to threaten the very existence of the art establishment. Thankfully, fewer and fewer people are interested in modern art. Although tourism is increasing, attendances at modern art museums are dropping, while more people are attending traditional art museums. There's also a huge backlash against conceptual art, led by groups like the Stuckists and the Arts Renewal, <laughs> and both of which are, of course, from the constant now, why, why are you cackling away there in the background? What's well, the... Okay, I'll, I'll tell you why I'm cackling away. So this is this man who was deriding Matisse and, 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 and railing against modern, modern art. Uh, if you want a laugh, look up Stuckists, S-T-U-C-K-I-S-T-S. Uh, if you just look at their Wikipedia page and then look at, at the bottom at the examples of, of Stuckist painting, you'll, you'll perhaps see why I was laughing. I, you don't have to do this now, but I'm just, just telling that to people. <laughs> The the, the 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 stuckists okay let me let me let me let me look at this this does uh, seem pretty degenerate so <laughs> did you see it? um so the, so so this is pjw's favorite is it the stuckists this is what he's uh chill, like <laughs> this is what he's chilling is it <laughs> what, what? I mean, he's holding <laughs> He's, he's holding this movement up as 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 a as a kind of example of of saving uh, a traditional art. Uh, I'm I, I'm not saying this to mock the the idea behind the movement. It was a it was basically a reaction to the 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 YBAs, the young British artists like Tracy Emin and Damien Hirst and and the, those those that lot, um, and, and basically trying to reassert the value of 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 painting, but. They right. did it with the most rubbish paintings that you could ever imagine. So, uh, but, but so I, again, it, I, I just think it, it, it's, it's it, all it well and bit, good. It, it, Go I would say it, it's a bit strange of him to at once uh, rail on Matisse and then to hold that <laughs> stuff up as being like, this is a great yeah. revival. <laughs> uh, any any defense of that, Pharaoh? No, he, he's one hundred percent right. One hundred percent there. All right, let's keep on going. Uh, I can't. I can't really hear that. I don't know oh, if there's can't, a problem. Can't hear it. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I I, I turned the uh, I turned the audio off. Oh, hold on. Mm. There you go. Against modern art by sitting on a toilet for two days. If she was British, the Turner Prize people would be falling over themselves to give her their annual award. Conceptual art is shit. It doesn't enrich our culture. It degrades and cheapens society by exalting the vulgar, the crass, and the scatological. And the people promoting it are preventing us from enjoying modern art produced by artists with actual talent. Those people are contemptible, regressive twats who should be ostracized, shamed, and left alone to play with each other's poo while genuflecting over its artistic brilliance. So there we go. We finally reached the end of the PJW video. Uh, any, anything to make for his, uh, his final flourish there? No? N n nothing, no. I mean, again, you know, I, I'll... I'll just go back to the kind of my central thesis of this. I mean, just, just do a Google image search for Matisse and, and tell me that... Uh, that that, uh, that that he was bereft of talent, uh, Paul Joseph Watson. I, I don't know. It's a very, it's a very strange. One. I mean, again, he 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 skirts around very interesting points and very and very valid ones, and yet he he again just goes for the lowest, the kind of lowest blows that he can land. And they're not even factual, you know. Again, he he just made so many weird assertions and and conflated so many things. That it just, you know, again, it, it could make a coherent video 
about some of these ideas, but it's it's going to take someone a lot more kind of I don't know um, honest perhaps than Paul Joseph Watson to do it. Wait. What 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 I learned is that uh, PJW likes uh, a group called the Stuckists, who <laughs> seem to don't who seem and and but he also likes uh, who is the hyper realist artist Ron Muick. Uh, yeah. yeah, he also likes Ron Muick. He likes is, he, he is, likes piece, he likes plastic statues of naked middle aged men. Hmm. Is Ron is Ron Muick the one who did Daddy? That one that I saw in the Saatchi gallery. Is it was that yes. Him? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. So I've never forgotten dead, that. Dead, dead, dad. Uh, you mean the, yeah. the little, yeah, the little like half size, yeah. Oh well, it's pretty big. I mean, it's like a, a oh. massive, a massive, a massive face. Uh, oh, okay. No, that's yeah. Okay, that's a different one. Dead dad is All a right. different Ron Muick, and and the giant grimacing baby, and the the huge, the huge like four year old boy. Yeah, they, those are all. Wrong, wrong okay, well, well, we're also going to do a straw poll. Sorry to do this, D, but people are asking for it. If you agreed with PJW, press one. If you agreed with D, press two. And we'll see what happens there. And then uh, we'll do some super chats as well. Well, good. Okay. And then they can all vote uh, because I reject I reject democracy. So can vote I, all you want. Do, can I just do a closing point as well, just like D did, if that's okay? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. What, what I would say is that uh, obviously PGW, totally bombastic, r ridiculous, straw manning constantly, but he does highlight some really important points, points around the value of different forms of art. Is trash worth the same as an oil, as an oil painting? Um, should art be rooted in the tradition of your country or should it be in international? And does, ob does objective beauty exist and should we focus on that, on the art? Those are the undercurrent truths that he said in that. Although, like, inflated and distorted and in a, in a weird, clickbaity way. So there is value in what he has to say. All right. Well, you see, I'm. it's kind of tricky to um, at once advocate for value-free Austrian economics, which uh, asserts that value is subjective as a central doctrine, and also sign up to the objective, you know, there's, there, this art is objectively better than that art idea. Um, although I did always, as a film fan, I was always interested to know why it was that certain films seemed to stand the test of time and others seemed to get forgotten. Um, even films that are critically lauded and given awards, some of them are still watched 20 or 30 or 40 years later, while others seem to just belong to the graveyard of history. Yeah. And I'm always interested by why that happens. Like it happens in every field. So, and I think I think that there that is a great positive uh, in all this. As I said, time is the great winner winnower of shit, and all of these things. I mean, they, these things that you that you that that we may object to. It time will will tell what what survives and what doesn't. And I suspect that a lot of these things that people are so put out by uh will certainly not survive so uh i, I i've just noticed that cuties has an audience score of five percent oh. on uh rotten tomato but a critical consensus of 90 percent on the tomato it's, meter it's so. the cor corrupted elite there corrupted elite <laughs> so i mean but I, I guess that would be an argument wouldn't it it would be like well you know um the, the the argument would be well if you if you don't don't uphold certain objective standards you end up with cuties. This is what's happened in the world that's allowed this to happen to the art world. Now now we filter down into active kind of uh, promotion of um, you know sexualization of children. All right, so let's have a look at the uh, let's have a look at the uh, super chat Jedi Knight Anakin Cringe Walker says. Modern art is worshipping the ashes of civilization you burn down because you can't admit you failed to do better. The, the, the saying is true. He who calls his father's fools proves his lineage. Any, any response? No. Uh, I, I, mean, I mean, what I would say is that I don't feel like... Um, the, 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 I think the artists 100% believe in themselves uh, in, and what they were doing. If you read what the modernists are saying, 
Um, you know, it, it could be worth us going through the Futurist Manifesto another time, because if you if you read that, you can get an idea of what was in their heads, and they totally believe that they are bringing the future, and it's a good thing. So I don't feel like they're doing it in a spiteful way or in a in any kind of way. They they feel like it's the correct thing to do. So I, I would defend them in that regard. Oh my God. I just spotted your uh, tweet, Pharaoh, from before the stream started. <laughs> it, it he's literally used man so <laughs> Oh my god. What what Sean D try to defend shit in a can as a form of art in only ten minutes time. And he literally did it. He he actually did defend that exact piece. Amazing. Um, yeah. um <laughs> one thing I will say though is that I haven't had the impression, and this could just be a uh, lack of knowledge on my part that all of these artists are actively disrespecting the traditions. Like I, I haven't seen any of them saying, oh, Michelangelo is shit or anything. Very, very few of them do. You will never, you, if you look like Picasso, another subject of, of pet subject of hate for a lot of people uh, uh, re regarding modern art, you will never see in, in any of his writings uh, a, a kind of idea that he came to destroy history. He firmly saw himself as a, the continuance of a tradition that went back uh, even to, to sort of pre-modern times. And, and because he, he again, like uh, Pharaoh mentioned at the beginning of the stream with the African masks and, and, and such and, and, and Catalonian um, sort of primitive art. Um, so yeah, that is absolutely right. I, I think that again, another mistake people make is that they, um, they, they take the critical line as being, the the explanation for things they believe the little plaque on the wall was the artist's doing and that is not the case the contextualization the way these things are presented these are all the work of people within these institutions with their own motives uh and their own agendas uh and so i, I think it's very important to, to to try to if you're if you if you feel an artist is 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 doing that is is disrespecting the kind of lineage of art. Go look at their work. Go don't just look at one piece. Go look at their work. Go try to read some of the things that they said yeah. about their yeah. own work and about history. And you will not find. I mean, there were some, and, but... and the fu the future the futurists among amongst them uh, who who very deliberately did talk about smashing the past. But um, what about what about if you go and check out the artist at the work? after checking out the stab canvas and and uh, finding out that all his other works are basically just stab canvases and slash canvases too. Ah, uh, Lucio Fontana. We <laughs> we have, I think we're out, we're, out of, we're out of time, unfortunately. We'll yeah, have to do that yeah. in another stream. Um, yeah. Nathan, I mean, this is the, this is the thing with uh, this sort of thing. Uh, somewhat, a little bit with the architecture, Pharaoh, the idea we could wrap it up in one stream was always foolhardy, right? Because um, yeah. these are these are massive topics that people devote their lives to studying. So, um, uh, if, if there's interest, I would certainly be pleased coming back and talking about it. Because I had a whole thing prepared about <laughs> about the, the the genesis of modernism and then and, and, and the perspective and medievalism and all this stuff. And we didn't, we, you know, we sort of didn't have time for any of it. So, yeah, if if if, if you want and people are interested, I'd be happy to come back again at some point. Yeah, like in between, this is like the weirdest series in the world. Me and Mark talking about Batman and then. <laughs> <laughs> on certain streams talking about modern art um uh nathan hood says only peasants don't like modern art um yeah th there seems to be a, a strange uh kind of elitist populist split in the audience i've noticed uh adam morgan says the entire museum campus in chicago is lovely um uh klaus vanklosen says relativists and subjectivists won't admit art is only relatively subjective see balance contrasts compositions and of course the golden ratio mm. uh, i think there's a fair point there to to a degree although i think a lot of the popular mythos of the golden ratio is is unfounded i mean yeah. again there there's all this talk about like like leonardo da vinci sort of uh, i think based on that book by that what was that book called? The Da Vinci Code, um, the, the, but, the which, which is which is which is which isn't true. He he never the, the golden mean. It it it's it, it's just it's a fabrication. So I I, I would be cautious about that. I, I don't think that that um, that can, that is I, as important as people think it is. Can I just ask one thing? I like watching the joy of painting with Bob Ross, as I'm sure a lot of people do, because it's very relaxing. 
Mm. But uh, is there any value in the Bob Ross painting at all? No. Because they they all seem to. I mean, he always does the same thing, right? He, he paints the kind of landscape, and then about ten minutes before the end, he puts a massive tree right in front. Always, yeah. every single episode, he always. All oh, right, I'm going to put a tree right here. I'm like, no, it's going to be. Your, and and then he puts a tree like on the on the front and in the right. Um, can you explain? Um, because to a certain sensibility, the sensibility that PJW touched on when he talked about realism, quote unquote, mm -hmm. the um, the skill of the Bob Ross painting would be high above the Matisse, wouldn't it? Because of the because of what he's doing there, because it looks, uh, you know, and he's done, done it in half an hour in liquid white. <laughs> so, I mean, could you explain to anybody why a Bob Ross would have value or wouldn't have value? I, I would say that Bob Ross's art is not those paintings. Bob Ross's art is that show and his, and the way he produced the show, uh, the, 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 the presentation, the, you know, in fact, I would say that Bob Ross is a conceptual artist, a performance artist, so to speak. Um, the, the, you're never going to see those pictures. Where are those pictures now? I've never seen one at, at any kind of gallery, any kind of secondary. <laughs> or, or the, New, the New York Times has found them, apparently. Oh. Where are where are all the Bob Ross paintings? <laughs> we question. found them. <laughs> I've always wondered where they are. Uh, I, I, again, I I still regard his art as being the show rather than the the pictures, but. Uh, so, so there we are. They're going to be put in the Smithsonian. I mean, is there value to these though, or is there is it just okay? I, th saying, I think it's a saying... cult I think it's a cultural artifact. There is value in them uh, as as painting. They're quite derivative of better things, uh, you know. And they are they are very mechanical. I mean, he was he was like a kind of living a kind of living Andy Warhol. You know, he produced basically the same painting over and over again just 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 using different techniques but uh, uh i do think there's value in them but again i, I think the value is in the show more than the, think the of it, picture think itself of, think of your old nan is she going to prefer the bob ross or is she going to prefer the the, the the matisse and i i sometimes think well maybe your old nan would prefer the the, the kind of bog standard middle of the road bob oh, ross my own, my, my my old nan <laughs> <laughs> owned a Matisse. <laughs> You're the wrong person to ask. You're exactly the wrong person to ask. <laughs> she must have been loaded. Uh, Will H says... Um, it's just a, it was just a drawing, but yeah. <laughs> all right, okay. Uh, You're getting too caught up in the detail, says Will H. Um, uh, better to use Carlisle and ask the state of art question. Something is rotten here, even if it's hard to name. Uh, would you agree with the Carlisle question that there is something rotten in the state of art in the art yeah. world in general yes obviously surely D you must even admit that from like a, a fiscal perspective the laundering it depends again it depends I don't I just think I don't think I don't agree that there is an art world there isn't just one art world yes I think in certain sectors of of the art market there are problems uh what the nature of those problems the, you brought up the laundering and i do think that that is a legitimate, legitimate problem but that happens not just with modern art i mean uh, one of the greatest cases of that in in my opinion uh was the was the spurious uh leonardo da vinci picture uh of the south of christ the salvador salvator mundi which was sold for i believe the highest price ever paid for a work of art and this was in the the, the the past 10 years and i think that there's something very suspicious about about that so yeah i do think that there there's something going there but i don't think that that's necessarily to do with with modernism i think that's something to do with with finance financial doings uh, doug well it, it, it's also it's also got to do with inflation if you really want to get into it um in you know why why are they needing to do all of this well there's a store. There is a certain store of value in it as well, isn't there? Isn't it? As an as just a solid investment. I think they. I think they also buy. You know, very wealthy people also buy wine. As like oh, yeah. in. Uh, yeah. yeah. So strangely, if you we want, if you want to sort of see as an example of of of, of value in a, in action, go to the Christie's website and you'll see that their their auctions. You know, they 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 have fine art, they have decorative art, they have wine, they have 
handbags. I mean, at literally, that one of the major categories of their auctions is handbags. Um, so, uh, yeah. Doug Nemitz says, for 20 uh, English pounds, the modern ideas D have permeated so far uh, further than you may realize. Even if we reject equality, it is still there in some way. That is why people are lowering of lower standing. They see themselves as being allowed to comment. So, so that's uh, I think that's Nemitz kind of backing you up there, D, saying that yep. this is the kind of covert egalitarianism of PJW or modern art. Yeah, he is. I, I, he's being. I think, people, yeah. I think that people should be required to take a short test before being admitted into the National Gallery of Art. But that's just me. <laughs> Charlemagne says D's best stream yet. Finally, he gets a chance to elaborate with low IQ interruptions. So, uh, wow. <laughs> so, so, so there we go. Uh, I think Charlemagne's attracted to the inherent elitism, which is, uh, you know, to be to be expected. I think uh, Jedi Knight Anna Quinn Gringewalker says a Russian client admitted to me that modern art is a scam to get around sanctions. Pay an evaluator to go up the value and buy it, then sell it to some London gallery to move cash out of Russia. And you have said that that does go on. So there's some. There could be some. It does go, but, it, but it, again, it's 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 most often not modern art. It's 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 quote unquote old masters. I mean, again, like the Salvador Mundi of, of of that may or may not be by Leonardo da Vinci. So, uh, but yeah, I mean that certainly does happen. But again, I don't think that's a problem of modern art so much as it's a that that's a that's a whole financial scheme in and of itself. Christoph Glennon says. Uh, dollar influence popularity equals good art voted by time and money. Um, you you could say that. I mean, um, uh, Spaghetto says. Well, well, the thing is, you have to remember that every individual's value scale is subjective, but in aggregate, the uh, price will suggest. As a society, this is what what you're making of it. Uh, I suppose you could say. Um, so and and I suppose the price will change over time, right? Have, have there any been any pieces that have gone massively down in value, or do they only ever go up? Oh yeah, yeah. oh no, they go down. They go down as well. A, a lot of the old masters have decreased, haven't they? In relative terms to gold and stuff since the forties. Yeah, well, I would say that because most of the old masters are, are, are the property of public collections at this point. I mean, most. I mean, they're with with exceptions, of course. Um, uh, but uh, I would say that most of that market is basically captured by institutions at this point. You know, uh, it literally, it's it's they're all in the collections uh, if, of these these great institutions. If Elon Musk wanted to buy the Mona Lisa, he'd be prevented, wouldn't he? There, 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 would, yeah, there would be that, such, that, that, be such an outcry; they wouldn't allow an individual no. billionaire to to buy something like that. No, that's that's not going to happen. But I mean, you know, museums do deaccession work, so they do sell off works in their collection. But they're not going to sell off any. They're not going to sell off the titians, You know, they're not going to sell off this or that. Um, but uh, but it again, that that does become a worry. And there 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 is this whole movement called decolonizing the art world, and legitimate collections are starting to sell off their their work ostensibly for the purpose of, of, of bringing in diversity for their collections. I think, again, there are financial motives there that, that aren't being spoken of. But uh, So who, who knows what the future holds? But that, again, is an institutional issue and why it's very important for us not to see these institutions to, to, the, to, these, to these evil people. Spaghetto says that the best part about modern art and architecture is that it has destroyed the idealism of the futurists, etc., and shown that the only way to beauty is to go back, as going forward only takes us to more ugly. What about that argument, Pharaoh? Do you agree, agree with Spaghetto there? Uh, I, I think yes to a degree, but I think be careful about going back and being stuck in the past. We need to build from tradition and not yeah. just simply live in it. Very, very good point. I, I think that's something that often when people say, well, well, we need sort of right-wing institutions. We need we need right-wing art. We need to re re return to traditional art. Well, you know, that just, that that's a very dangerous notion. You have to be very careful about what you mean by that, because just just 
sort of living in a past and producing simulacra of of of, of historical styles. Uh, uh, that's what leads to kind of sort of a hollow academic work that that was a self defeating system in the end. So so I do, I do think that you're absolutely right about that. You 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 can't get you can't don't let romanticism kind of guide what what it is when you talk about finding an, a, 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 a finding an aesthetic, uh, a so-called right-wing aesthetic, whatever that may be, or or an institution. You know, it can't be founded upon upon romantic romantic ideas of the past. I I, I do want to say something as well. Um, I've always thought that medieval art is a bit shit, <laughs> and I'll tell oh, you why. Right, no, right. I, no. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you why. Because all their faces are a bit flat and two D, and everybody's just like, "Oh, look, there's another pointy, there's another pointy nosed man in a church." I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to withhold comment because okay. this, this is very much part of the, of the, the things I prepared to talk about, which we didn't get to. So uh, we can, we can talk about that another, another time because that's a whole subject that yeah, I, I do think needs to be addressed, and it is something related to. The, again, the trajectory that, that that led to abstraction. Um, Although I, I will say, I have found one bit, bit of medieval art, art that I really do like. Do you want to see it? Yeah, skulls. <laughs> I was, I was going to say things things you'd like. You'd like the ambassador oh. by Holbein. That's got a huge skull at the bottom. Yeah, but oh, that, isn't, medi- that, 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 that isn't medieval art. There, there but it, 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 it's I, Renaissance. The one you're dis- the way you're displaying isn't medieval art either, AA. Uh, oh right. Oh, sorry. I, I can't I can't quite see it, but that's not I can look at just from the tiny little image on my phone, I can tell you that that is not medieval art there. Yeah. I oh, it's funny oh. enough, Pharaoh. I, I, I DM'd a a, 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 a a reproduction of the ambassadors while while we were talking because he was talking about liking skulls. So. <laughs> Oh, all right, so let's uh, let's carry on with the super chats. Uh, um, uh, in Interboom, for ten English pounds, says look up bullshit makes the art grow profounder. Auto generated and real abstract paintings were randomly renamed and shuffled together in rigorous experiments to judge their objective profundity. So this is um, this is a variation on that uh, Sockel hoax where. They also generated uh, essays and put them into low tier, low tier journals, and um, you know, supposed experts couldn't tell the difference. Uh, doesn't this uh, doesn't this expose the whole thing? This sort of thing, the auto generated abstract paintings. Nobody can no, tell the difference. No, you, you you, you, because you can you can lie in the grass and look up at the clouds and find beauty in the clouds, and that is a, a purely random. Well, it's not random, really, but it, it's a it's a purely kind of accidental phenomenon. You know, you can look at a, a mountain. I mean, a mountain. You know, depending upon your conception of creation, but a mountain occurred because of you know tectonic shifts and 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 and, and glacier, glaciers and things like that. I mean, you know, they were produced uh, unconsciously by natural processes, and yet we still call them beautiful. So of course, I mean, it's, a machine could certainly produce a random, beautiful work. I don't think that. I don't think that's an argument at all. Oh God, what's going on in this medieval painting? Oh, so, sorry, sorry for this uh, <laughs> side. What on earth is that? Is it like a Spanish fresco, maybe? Mm. That that yeah that well, that looks that looks Spa- yeah that looks Spanish or uh, yeah that's maybe like a Marian child, I'd say. The thing That's is, it's, like, it's, it's almost like an icon, like an icon work there, where they purposely massively abstract, like all the clades and stuff are super highlighted and very stri- stri- uh, structured, and that's in, that's mm. intentional because you're not meant to show the physical form. It's all about purely showing, like it's, it's like a post iconoclasm. It's, it's a whole load of uh, other thing, but yeah, I mean, all, all not- I can all I can think about looking at this is Todd Browning's Freaks, and anybody who's seen that film will know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, it is a bit like that. Yeah. Well, you're, oh, you're right. looking at it through 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 a modern eye, you know. Again, it, it's 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 you have to be very careful when when sort of judging medieval works or any work really with with what we know now. Uh, but but you see, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at as well, though, is that everybody's image of what good art is is comes back to the Renaissance ultimately, and not to. So when people are talking about tradition, 
they they their mind goes to Michael, you know, Michelangelo or you know the stuff that you'd see at the Vatican. They're not thinking of no, that. Is what I just showed. No, no. Uh, am, I, am I am I wrong? No, no. Like, like yeah. the whole Gothic movement loves medieval art. Or, yeah. Like or, like all of the pre-Raphaelites purposely went before Raphael. No, no, and... no, no, no. I'm not. I'm not. Talk I'm talking about literally the man on the street. The PJW yeah. level, the yeah, but that, 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 that is a narrative. I mean, that is a narrative. It's, it's the same way that people say, "Oh, well, Shakespeare is the pinnacle of 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 of, of you know of, of English." I mean, he was, uh, but that's sort of beside the point. It is a mythos that developed and developed quite quite a bit after Shakespeare. You know, just just yeah, as, true, as true, saying yeah. just as saying that that, that J. S. Bach is the pinnacle of of of, of Western music. Well, J. S. Bach was was forgotten for like almost a hundred years before he was he was sort of revived in the nineteenth century, uh, and and people got to to hear it again. You know, so I mean, this idea that you know this was always sort of perceived as being the pinnacle of art. I mean, I think that that's a that's an idea that was promulgated much later, and but but you're right about that, huh? Uh, and see, I'm I'm in the minority because I actually, you know, I actually um, I tend to look back beyond that. I tend to look to the mini miniature mini miniaturist uh, tradition uh, of medieval uh, art and late medieval art as being a, a great pinnacle. Uh, so, like the pre raphael Raph Raphaelites that uh, Farrow mentioned. Spaghetto says modern art has discarded beauty in favor of a conversation about the nature of art and its relativism. It can be safely abandoned by the common people. Um, yeah, I mean, I saw the other day that uh, Towie has turned ten, and let's face it, most of the common people are just watching Towie. They, they don't need to. They don't need to worry. Is is there not a uh, merit to the argument that the? Uh, I mean, you know, I always remember in nineteen eighty four. The proles were allowed to have their own like little folk arts and pop music and stuff because the Big Brother like literally didn't care. Like it, it actually didn't really matter this, what this, the proles were consuming. You know, this is, this is this is going back to my point about the usages of art again. I think if if you consider that it has a moral and transcendent purpose, you need to have the interaction with the proles. That's literally why the um, the Greeks had stat they had relief work and statues tied to the temple. So, yeah, maybe the proles aren't going to the temple every single day, but the days, the times they do interact, they can understand the, the transcendence and they, ca they can focus on what heroism looks like. And that's, that's what we have lost. We, we, I feel like we've may maybe gone a bit too elite where we, we're, we're trying to cut people off entirely, where we don't want to be led by populism. It should be led by the elite, but almost like um, the shepherd with his sheep. We should be gu guiding people. But they, they do they see that the, the, my... I mean, I don't want to reference. Uh, this is a point that Bow Bowden makes. It will come out somewhere, and uh, like so, in the example of uh, well, what does the prol go to to find his heroism? And lo and behold, you have all the superhero comics and the Batman yeah. and the Superman. Again, and I, 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 it again, comes I, out I, somewhere. I don't, I don't have a problem with that, but again, I think you still need that that guidance from above because to, to make them interested in heroism in the first place. Uh, Sensum Cominium says, well, but, but did they though? Did, did anybody need guidance to go and read Superman and Batman? Um, yeah. Well, I, I, th I think the, the ideas of heroism were instilled oh, oh. because the, the leaders of the time were, were wanted to be heroes. Again, people looked up to someone like Eisenhower in the 40s, and he, he, was, a, he was an elite, elite fi figure that tried to, to carry out hero, heroic ideas. And so, so it descends from above, culture comes from above. So you're you're saying that because of the robust foreign policy of Ronald Reagan, <laughs> there, therefore people were interested in Rambo and Conan the Barbarian and Arnold Schwarzenegger films. Okay, I guess my point is, if you compare to a, a, a person today compared to a person eighty years ago, they're more interested in, in like you said, Tarry or Love Island as opposed to anything which is wholesome or or, or that has moral fortitude. They would rather have a cuties than a um you, you know something else that, like think think that would, would a program like civilization even be commissioned let alone watched by people com uh, compared to the 50s and that's because the 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 general populace has has descended in terms of their um general moral standing ah so now we get to the now we get back to elitism good good <laughs> you're right about that pharaoh i agree 100 uh, percent um okay so, sense of comenium says um, given the recent mostly peaceful riots and stabbings, I would imagine that police photo fit artists are having something of a renaissance. 
Yeah, okay, yeah, true. Uh, I, if I've seen some awful photo fit <laughs> artists. <laughs> they terrible. I don't know. They're, they're always terrible. I didn't understand. I didn't understand. <laughs> uh, J- Jedi Knight Anakin Grinjewalker says, Pharaoh, do you think the current art scene mirrors that of the decline of Roman art? No, because it the Roman art shifted into different art forms. Like sculpture was got, got rubbish, but mosaics were still really good even up to the end of the Roman Empire. Like I, I, I think I think the problem we have is that like I said, I, I really feel like our entire elite is um is corrupted and have, have their hearts in the wrong places and they basically just need re- replacing with a new new elite that will uh act as a shining vision to the proles. That's what we need. Yeah, and Roman and we, sculptures were just cheap copies of Greek sculptures, anyway. So, Charlemagne says the beauty of modern art and postmodern. Do you know what? I was watching this. Um, I was watching this uh, show. Uh, I I didn't watch it. I watched about ten minutes of it. It was on BBC One called Harlots. Okay, and they had this awful exchange. Uh, it's kind of set in the late seventeenth through the eighteenth century, from what I could make out, and it, it follows a group of prostitutes around. Um, I have to say, for uh, you know, early 18th century London, there were quite a lot of uh, people of colour around. Um, but but aside from that, uh, they had a um, they, they, there was this exchange where they were talking about the Greeks and the Romans, and um, the um, you know the, the they were talking about the relative merits, and the woman was saying, you know, oh well, the Greeks had all the philosophers and so on. Oh, I think the chap was say was talking about uh, the art and the philosophy. But then the woman said, "Yes, but the Romans had the bigger empire," and this was a, and this was presented as a as a as a kind of profound exchange. But it really it really struck me as a kind of as a kind of midwit appropriation of what educated conversation would sound like presented for <laughs> proles. It was a very interesting exercise in you know just kind of awful <coughs> writing. Um, but the whole the whole show was like that, you know. Anyway. Um, uh, I don't recommend it. Um, Charlemagne says, the beauty of modern and postmodern art is in its truth. Art reflects abstractions of the real, and modern art does reflect what is real now. And the rose-tinted view of the past eras of art is an unreality. Mm. I, 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 I feel that, uh, I feel that that's a, a tick in the D column. Um, do you disagree with that, though, Pharaoh? Yeah, because you, I mean, we're basically saying that uh, I, I do agree to a degree that I feel like in in the way, the same way that Ruskin says about that, um, the 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 production of art is due to the, the moral standing moral standing of the people within a country, and I feel like we've got crap people, so we're producing crap art. I think I think that yes, it is a reflection in that regard, but it's not necessarily a good thing. I don't want to do that. I want to change people and make them better and produce better better art. Just because it's the just because it's the like. That as a situation we're in doesn't necessarily mean we should just sit down and uh, think that it's great. I have to say, though, I've been to some of those uh, galleries in Rome, you know, of the old masters. And once you've been to the 10th room of Virgin with Child, I'm like, come on, I've got to paint something <laughs> oh, else. No. Come on. Of course, the materialist is- atheist would say. <laughs> this is why I like the Caravaggio. It's like, oh my God, something else is happening. I've yeah. seen I've seen eight hundred and twenty two Virgin well, with it, Child today, and this put this dude's put a bloody skull in the photo. Amazing. Well, and that's and, and that's what happened. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, well, when Caravaggio came onto the scene, it basically obliterated an entire a, a, a sort of mode of working, and then suddenly everyone started to do you know sort of mannerist work, Caravaggio-esque work. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, that's that's exactly what happened when the, when these innovations came along. The 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 work that had been the the kind of dominant paradigm of of, of the time fell away very quickly. You know, um, and and uh, so in, and that's that's what the, you know that innovation has always happened. That's always the, happened. The only point of interest in the in the in the other ones is when you get those big scenes, and it's like ah. Oh, here, Raphael has put himself in the in, in in this is we think this is a self portrait, but he's put himself in the in the figure of Plato, or there's a lot of that sort. Of, that there's, there's a lot of kind of weird self references. Well, he, in, he uh, is. In, he, you're talking about the the school of Athens, the the wall yeah, painting yes. at the Vatican. Yeah, yeah. He didn't yeah. he didn't put himself in the figure of 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 Plato, uh, but um um 
but uh, he's in there somewhere, he is, isn't he? He is in there. His his portrait is in there, uh, along with with many of his his, his the, uh, other artists of the time. You know, um, yeah. um, uh, Plato and Aristotle, or, or uh, 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 it's, you know, one of them is Leonardo da Vinci. Um, Michelangelo is there, brooding in the foreground uh, with his yeah. with his head upon his hand. You know, there there are sort of identifiable portraits of of of, of his contemporaries in in that picture. So yeah. yeah, that's by far the most interesting thing in that whole like you know until you get to the Caravaggio, and then it's like oh yeah, there's loads of stuff going on now. Oh. You can see the you can see the motion and the light and the. <laughs> Skulls. <laughs> you would you would fail my test to get into the art He's, gallery. He, he says he loves <laughs> symbolism and then doesn't like medieval art. So you know. <laughs> I know <he's> a... <laughs> contradictions. <laughs> it's contradictions. This man. I like. Uh, I, I, I I like. I like Holbein as well. I like it because that's got skulls too. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> Nathan Hood, Nathan Hood uh, says. An important aspect is the attitude of the viewer towards the art. It is to feel, um, is it to feel pleasure from seeing pretty things or is it to experience the other? This, this, this is the point around, like I said, uh, is, it, is, is, the, is the beauty in the object or is it in the perception from the person? And again, the traditional view is it's in the, in the object. Um, and again, this whole idea of emotions is a 19th century modernist co concept in its, in its entire its entire right. People did not think about like how did art make me feel before um, you know Darwin, Bain, and um, William James's work on the emotions in like 1890. Mm, yep, I would agree. Okay. I mean, a, a lot of the a lot of the dialogue about the way we speak about art is 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 a sort of 19th century it's always it's very strange that the world is so mired in the 19th century from marxism to 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 these these sort of victorian mindset and these romantic ideas about things it's very strange that so many of the kind of the way we think about the world just basically got stuck in the 19th century it, it is interesting that, but I I also reject the thesis because there's no doubt that when the uh, when the kind of late uh, when the uh, when the when the the fifteenth uh, or was it early sixteenth century chap uh, was going around was going around looking at the paintings and came across this, he was like, oh my god, this is something amazing. This makes me feel <laughs> great. You know, come on, they were they were they were feeling. It was like, oh look at that. Were they not? They must have. They must have been feeling, even if they didn't. Well, I mean, it depends on your on your on your worldview, but um, certainly their, 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 the way that they talked about it and the way they conceived it is from a a Christian psychology of the passions, as opposed to an, emo an emotional one. They would never say this painting <clears throat> makes me feel like this. You know, they certainly wouldn't say it. I mean, you could say that maybe it's going in their heads, and that's the question around emotions versus the, the, the passions, but um, so, certainly from the, how art was thought about pre that period of time, that, that's just how it was. All right, so let, let's keep on, let's keep on going. Um, uh, managerial Elite Toaster <laughs> says, uh, <laughs> Johannes Vermeer, good example. Watch the movie Tim's Vermeer. Oh, yes, of course, Tim's Vermeer. So th this is a film that was, I think, produced by... Um, by Teller of Penn and Teller, um, and uh, and it is basically kind of telling the story of this. Um, I can't remember who who the the man in the film is, but he he decided that he he's, well, wasn't an artist and he was going to set out and see if he could make if he could actually repaint or if he could paint a Vermeer using what we think we know about how Vermeer produced some of his pictures which was using a device called the camera obscura um and it, it's a very interesting film i i don't necessarily agree with the conclusions because the the the, the, the con he did produce a painting that looks looks like a vermeer to some degree but it isn't you know there there is something lacking from it there is it's it's almost like producing a a perfect perfect simulation of a human but with no soul at all 
So, and, and then this is something that comes up, and again, which we can talk about in, an, in, an, in another art stream. Um, but this this idea that that the what we regard as the great masters of the, of, of the past and their relationship to various technologies, you know, and that that's something that the average person, I think, gets very uncomfortable about the idea that that there were tools available to artists that made things a lot easier than it would seem. Uh, Spaghetto says for ten US dollars, lol. How come art didn't survive postmodernism? I could ask the same about anyone who has political ideas. If modern art is fine because it beat out classic art, then progressivism is the future. Uh, did anybody make that argument though? I, I don't. I don't even quite understand what what what. what the, guy, the, guy, yeah, the guy's saying that because there's so much modern art that it's like classicism has been defeated. I think. I think maybe Charlemagne with his comment around it's just like that. That's that what's produced. But again, maybe I'm not reading into it correctly. Uh, I, or maybe when it was D, maybe when it was D saying um, uh, about you know if if these values are transcendent, then why aren't they rising? Something like this. Mm. Or, um, Hollow nineteen sixteen says, but AA, hey, how did that rock make you feel? I mean, it didn't make me feel. I, it was just a rock. But to be <laughs> honest, and I'm I'm it's being a, it's a very big rock. You have to. <laughs> I'm being perfectly honest here. David doesn't do anything for me either. I oh. for hours. I, it doesn't do anything for me. Uh, have, you, um, have, you, have you seen it physically? Yeah, did nothing for me. I had to queue for bloody hours. Where, whereas Caravaggio, I'm like, oh, <laughs> it's so much going on. But well, it's, it's just, if, 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 if if a 16 foot naked man doesn't do anything for you, then I'm just his name. It's just 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 a statue. Oh um, my god. This is this. I mean, and then again, I am a, I'm a, you know, like I said, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a true philistine when it comes to this. I like going, I like going, but you know, I, I, I have uh, pedestrian tastes. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Charlemagne said, I mean, I don't see what all the fuss is about. What's all the fuss about? Uh, Moving on with the super chats, please. Yeah. <laughs> Charlemagne says, PJW acts like the number of plebeians staring dumbly at art in museums with ideas they've been told about to think has anything to do with the value of art. So, so there we go. I mean, is it true that most of the people in museums and galleries are plebeians? Well, I yes. mean, it's, it, it, would be, <laughs> it, would be, it would be me kind of no, yeah. li listening, listening to that, listening to that little um, uh, a device they give you to listen to. Oh, you know, right. pr press 63. Oh, this, uh, this painting, which has been stabbed has got a, um, is this ca this canvas with pencil stabs in it shows shows the infinity of light coming through? Next. It, 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 in in some ways, I feel like it's not really plebeians; it's the kind of middle class midwit that's there. If you put yeah. like a North FC guy in around a modern museum, I think he would have a better idea of the transcendent than the than the midwit. He would just be like, <laughs> like that, don't like that. Can you imagine one of the best? I want to make this right. I get Morgoth. Me and Mr. D walk around an art yes. gallery, and you just, yes. and you, and you just, you just, rec you just record the results. I think it'd be really interesting. I, I, I honestly think it would be really interesting. Um, yeah. So, um, if, it, if it didn't come to blows, I, I mean, Morgoth seems quite pugilistic. Sometimes. Um, S Sed says, "Look at Skagen painters, Skagen Mill. They're a mix of impressionism and realism." and a predecessor to modernism, specifically Christian Krogh, who taught Edward Edvard Munch, who did the scream, of course. So um, are you familiar with these uh, with these guys, the Skagen, Skagen painters? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, a little bit, because right? I, cause I quite admire uh, Eva Munch, but um, I, I don't know. Uh, again, it's been so long since I've looked into that history that I, I, I couldn't comment on it. But uh, let's have a little look. I'm not seeing many skulls. It's, it's kind <laughs> of like it's a little bit like French realism, isn't it? But in the um, Denmark, yeah, uh, Norway, yeah. Oh, was sorry, it, that, was that, that was pretty cool. Is that a wicker, is that a wicker man? It's pretty cool. <laughs> I like that one. I think, you know, I think I think I think these are perfectly nice, but I mean, I'm not that that a fan of like this kind of realist style painting personally. So. Mm. 
this is this one's quite interesting. There's lots to have a little uh, nose at. Kind of reminds me of that. Kind of reminds me of that film uh, that we all watched. Uh, what was it? The, do you remember the one which went back and oh, um, Re- Requiem for a Village. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah, so it's. I mean, yeah, it's quite nice. I, I, I like the, the loneliness of this one. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, let's carry on. Um, uh, Je- Jedi Knight Anakin Cringewalker says, "Oh yes." A Jesus cigar on a non-cigar stream. Um, JS also says Bob Dylan uh, swapped his Andy Warhol print for a sofa. Not a print. <laughs> uh, it's a, that is a very famous story, and I, I, I can tell you that Bob Dylan that probably is one of the biggest regrets of his entire life. So yeah, so Bob, Bob Dylan was 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 uh, associated with Andy Warhol's um, milieu. Uh, and they they knew each other and 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 had lots of encounters certainly in the 1960s, and at I don't know whether Dylan bought it or if um, it was a gift, but Dylan for a time owned uh, one of Warhol's uh, silver Elvis pictures. Uh, I I don't know which one was Dylan's. There's 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 a few of them. Um, basically, it's a, they were kind of very large. I think the, the pictures are about eight feet tall uh, of of sort of a repeated image of Elvis, silk screened over a silver, uh, a metallic silver background. Um, and so Dylan had this, and then at some point, he traded it with Albert Grossman, his his manager in the sixties. Yes, yes. He traded. He gave Grossman this Warhol painting of of. Uh, the Elvises for a, a sofa, <laughs> and um, so if you look, uh, let me let me let me find. A, I'll I'll find out why. I, 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 I'm assuming it's this one that we're looking at right here. Yeah, uh, there, there's a, it may be that one. I, I thought it was a triple one, but it, it may be that one. Yeah, if, if he's standing beside it, it's probably that one. Um, let me let me find. I, I need a I need a give you a figure so you right. could go on with the super chat while i, I look if you want okay um in- interestingly two of my least favorite david bowie songs are a uh, song for bob dylan and his andy warhol <laughs> song <laughs> I, for some, re- <laughs> I, some reason i I've, I've, I've never liked those two songs I, I don't like i don't i don't like i don't like the the, the the dylan song but i i do like um i do like the andy warhol song so. although I, I did i did once write um a play or, or a screenplay uh which extensively used that um because the character was called andy and in my imagination there i wanted that to be i wanted that to be playing in the background it was about um it was about a uh it was called decay and it was about this guy who'd been doing a phd since 1982 and i and like he just stayed there as like a kind of relic where all the world was just moving on and he was just still stuck um and i i, I liked the central image of a cake kind of decaying over time um and the cake was given as a kind of celebration in 1982 for him like having gone to oxford uh, so, so this, this, of, is, this is like sort of Miss Havisham from uh, Dickens. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it was blatantly uh, kind of, yeah, <laughs> blatant. But uh, what, can, what, can you, what, what can you say? You're, you're quite derivative when you're when you're when you're young. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, here we go. So, so uh, one of one of Warhol's uh, double Elvis uh, pictures sold at Christie's uh, last May for fifty three million dollars. So right, Bob. <laughs> but I'm I'm sure Bob Dylan doesn't need fifty three million dollars. He probably doesn't need it, but it, it, uh, it just seems like a poor decision to have to live with. Uh, okay, so let, let's uh, let's keep, keep on uh, going then. Um, uh, Ar- Artemis says, "I can't wait to hear D defend the Black Square communist propaganda." Mind you. Oh. Okay, we can do that if you like. Are we uh, talking, is, is, he's talking is, about, about Kasimir Malievich, yes. Um, he was a Russian artist who um, is is very much kind of associated with the kind of advent of, of purely um, non-objective uh, art or abstract art or let's, geometric, let's, geometric let's, art. Let's take a look at it. Yeah, there you go. 
Yeah. I mean, don't bother looking at it because it, it looks terrible now because it's cracked uh, and it's it's falling. It's it's basically falling apart because it was it was locked away by the Soviets for like 80 years and, 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 and never seen. So uh, but I would say that it had nothing to do with uh, communist propaganda because uh, because Malievich was suppressed, you know, uh, very quickly after the after the revolution. Um and basically forced to produce what they called socialist realism. So, uh, yeah. again, I, I think people often conflate the um, the, the the kind of um, Russian um, modernism, trends of Russian modernism, like suprematism and the you know Malievich and the, these sorts of things, constructivism with the Soviets. But I, I think it's important to re- remember that 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 those avant-garde movements were very quickly put down by the communists. I mean, Stalin had very Kind of set tastes, didn't he? What he He's what very, he P- very PJW. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, all right. Um, I think that'll. Uh, I think that'll do. Uh, this stream has been called "Elites Sneering at PJW." Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is uh, only partly true. Pharaoh stuck up for him the whole way, and um, I am. Um, I probably less, you know, PJW at least has discerning tastes between, you know, different movements within modern art. Whereas, um, whereas I disparage David. So I know. I mean, it turns out that you're the real enemy here. (laughs) Well, well, indeed. Um, at Dangerfield in the chat saying he's been on the piss with Damien Hurst. So, uh, I mean, did, 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 that is, I would say, Evan and Hurst and the, I don't know what they call them, like the 90s kids or the, the, the young... The, young the YBAs, the YBAs, young British artists, yes. Yeah, now, d- would you say, and, you know, it's famously the sheep in the, was it the sheep in the tank and the unmade bed? It's and the uh, hide in the bed, and yes. Yeah, yes. was there a shark at one point? Uh, there is a like shark, that? it's, it's uh, yeah, it's a... That was a that sort of became a famous case because it started to rot, and so um, it was it was purchased and I think given permanent loan to Metropolitan yeah. Museum in New York, and so Hearst Hearst had basically had to sort of replace the shark, and that that was a big controversy yeah. because I, I mean yeah. they they were they were part of um, the absolute cringe that was Cool Britannia, if you remember the uh, the Tony Blair nineteen ninety seven campaign. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure they were invited along with uh, Oasis and Blur and all the others who turned <laughs> up. Which, um, uh, it, incidentally, though, Noel Gallagher is actually kind of a little bit based. I used to listen to, um, I used to listen to Russell Brand's uh, radio show, and it was entertaining purely for when Noel Gallagher would call in and just call him a, you know, basically call him a wanker, which was, <laughs> which was a lot. Of, he's kind of a, like a Carl Pilkington vibe about him, uh, which I quite, which I quite enjoyed. Um, so, uh, but anyway, uh, Hurst and Emin, I- any defense of them? Uh, I mean, it, it's difficult. Uh, I, I think Emin gets a little bit of a bad rap, uh, although I think much of her work is completely insufferable. Um, as far as Hurst is concerned, I mean, again, if you've seen a lot of those, they're they're quite impressive, just technically. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm sort of very in, 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 interested in, in in the kind of high level of processes that go up, go go into making those things. But they they do, they do nothing for me. There's a famous story though about um, Francis Bacon, if you know um, the the figurative yeah. painter Francis Bacon. Um, very late in his life, uh, someone describes seeing him at a Damien Hurst, lo- looking at a Damien Hurst sculpture, like sitting for hours watching it, and the sculpture was these sort of two chambers, and one was a, one was it contained a rotting carcass of, of beef, um, with covered with maggots uh, that that would then develop into flies, and then the other chamber had uh, a, a an electrical bug zapping lamp, and so the the fly, the maggots would turn into flies, and the flies would fly into the other chamber and then get zapped. And apparently, uh, Francis Bacon sat and watched this for hours. Uh, but it, but Hurst, you know, sort of does nothing, nothing for me. Uh, I think Hurst is now. I, I would call him basically a real estate mogul because I think most of his funds uh, came from his property buys in London. Um, 
I, I'd imagine he just hangs out with Zoe Ball and um, who was that guy? Who's that um, filmmaker? You know, Snatch and uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, oh, oh, uh, Guy Ritchie. Yeah. yeah, Guy Ritchie, Zoe Ball, um, Hurst, and probably um, who was the other? Who was the other kind of uh, very nineties figure? Somebody like uh, probably Chris Evans, <laughs> Johnny Vaughan. They were all like hanging out in a pub together somewhere, uh, talking about the good old days. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, Fat Boy Slim. He'd be he'd be hanging out with them. I'm sure. Um, uh, th- in fact, probably the best film that captures that era is that film, uh, Love, Honor, and Obey. I, I still recommend that. It's a lot of fun. Mm. Um, now, I have seen some uh, deep lore entries here. Somebody said, somebody's already <laughs> memed me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which, uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of truth to that. There's a lot of truth uh, to that. I mean, there's more depth in Skeletor than there is in David. Because Skeletor, over hundreds uh, of episodes, over, uh, over hundreds of episodes of He-Man, he loses every single week and he, and he never gives up. And there's, there's something in that. Whereas, uh, I mean, it's just a bloke, isn't it? It's just a muscular bloke standing in a. So, I, I would, I, I, I'd get more. Uh, my, my literary mind would wring more material out of the eternal struggle between Skeletor and, and He Man than, um, uh, yeah. And, and then I could, uh, obviously, I could probably get an hour out of comparing his tactics to, uh, to Mumra's tactics, because um, unlike, like Skeletor would often get his ass kicked. Um, whereas whereas Mumra would um, would often blame a patsy, you know, he'd just give a slide the bollocking at the end of Thundercats. Um, so there was a you know there was a neat bit of hierarchy in Mumra's gang. Mumra would very seldom get his comeuppance, but uh, T-Man would regularly kick Skeletor's ass. Okay, let, let's 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 carry on. Um, yeah, I think that was it. I think that's all the super chats. Uh, we can get out of here. I, I I've noticed Benjamin Rude is uh, boasting about his art credentials. He said he um he had he's got one of the best M- he went to one of the best uh, MFA courses in the country and um, he disdains philistines essentially so m- maybe I should get Benjamin Rude on to talk uh, with with D um, but he also agrees that uh, David is overrated as well so may- so maybe not <laughs> okay. Um, Anything to add, uh, Thero, uh, before we get out of here? No, it's great. Thanks very much. I, 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 I enjoyed it. So thank you very much, everyone. Now get out. And uh, if you want more Mr. D talking about art, let me know in the comments. Let me know in the, in the chat. And I will, uh, I will take note of your Philistine opinions. Because I'm the, I'm the voice and I'm the, I'm the champion of the working man. I won't, I won't disdain your views like these two elitists. All right. Bye, everyone.